Hey, I'm on the edge of my seat here, back again with another brand new video, and today I will be no damaging the entirety of the Resident Evil remake. I'll be doing Jill's Path. This game does have separate campaigns. First there's Jill, and then there's Chris. The campaigns are very similar with slight differences. The reason I went with Jill is that for my first time no damaging Resident Evil remake, this is the easier path to take. Jill, she can hold more items, and she has access to the lockpick, which allows her to open certain doors that, in the Chris campaign, he'd have to go to another area to pick up a specific key that opens those doors, but Jill just kind of negates that. However, the one downside of Jill's path is that she doesn't have immediate access to the lighter, but that's not such a big issue. And, well, another issue is that she has less health than Chris, so she takes less damage, she dies quicker, so there is that, but this is a no damage run, so the whole damage thing is kind of pointless because whenever I do get hit, that's when my run ends, so in that aspect, Jill and Chris are the same. And in this beginning section, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to exit out of these doors two times to kind of activate a few cutscenes, which pretty much makes the zombie that shows up in that one room. There's this really famous scene in the original Resident Evil and in this remake where you enter a room and then the zombie is eating a body, he looks back, and then there's a zombie in that room and he's a... He's a little troublesome, let's say. But you can kind of skip that scene by going back and then activating that cutscene where Barry's like, you got cold feet? Because once that happens, you pretty much run up to the room. There's a cutscene where the zombie comes into this hallway and Barry kills that zombie. And then that zombie's not in that hallway anymore. However, there will be another zombie in that hallway later in the game. And, well, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll get to meet him later, but... Yeah, uh, Resident Evil Remake isn't exactly a great title, though to be fair, to be completely fair, this game isn't called Resident Evil Remake. It is a remake of the original Resident Evil, but like with other remakes, it's just called Resident Evil. It has the exact same name as the original game, though to be even more clear, um, this is uh, not the GameCube version, because the GameCube version is called Resident Evil. I actually own it. That's actually the first time I beat this game. Like, I'll tell you, I bought Resident Evil on the GameCube, and I played it on my GameCube, but then I sold my GameCube, but then I bought a Wii that could play GameCube games, so then I played it through there, but my history with this game is that I bought it, like, a really long time ago, and I just was not able to beat it. I got stuck really fast. Like, this game, it is a puzzle to solve. Like, there's just so many, like, misleading little sections here and there, like... You collect an item near the beginning of this game that you don't use till like over halfway through into the game. It's just like it is so easy to get lost and like go into the same rooms and not do anything important. And like that's just part of the fun with this sort of stuff. So here I'm going to use the pistol to kill the two zombies in this area. There's the one zombie I shot over there, though I don't I'm not 100 percent sure if I actually killed the zombie over there. In fact, I'm not even sure I'm gonna kill this zombie because what I'm going to do in this run is I'm actually going to not use the pistol for most of it. We're going to pretty much use up most of the pistol in this first part. Then we're just going to get rid of the pistol and never use it again. And we're going to stick with the shotgun and grenade launcher. Though I will admit... Uh, oh yeah, so let me get back to the Resident Evil GameCube thing. So the version you're seeing right now, this footage is not from the GameCube version. It's actually from the HD remastered of this remake that's on Steam. Because, well, I beat this on GameCube, I played Chris's Path on GameCube, and then, for convenience sake, since there was a Steam summer sale going on, I picked up the remake for $5 so that I could record the game on my Steam Deck. However, you may notice that that door looks a little disgusting. <laughs> it's because the graphics are on medium settings. And what the medium settings do is that it makes all the doors look disgusting. And the reason I did that is because, for some reason, this game just runs slow if I play with, like, the full graphics settings. And also... Even just jumping into this game normally on PC and so sometimes in this run that zombie's head would explode but for some reason it just didn't explode at this point but whatever he's dead and now yeah and also the amount of bullets zombies take is a little random and also I'm playing on real survival and on the real survival difficulty uh, there is no auto aim like the aiming in this game is a little weird and like a bit finicky here and there kind of purposely purposefully I was about to say purposelessly, because like, that was an easier word to say. No, it isn't. But yeah, no, like, the aiming being a little wonky is, like, it does have a purpose, you know? It makes the survival horror more horror -y, per se. And I haven't played the remake of the second game, which makes the aiming a little bit more controlled with you, but still kind of janky in its own unique way. 
I, you know, I do plan on no damaging the original Resident Evil 2 and the remake of Resident Evil 2 at some point, but for now, I have to sneeze. <coughs> <coughs> I love the atmosphere in this little area. This is like an area where you have to collect these books and each book, wait, no, no, no. Okay, so this area, you have to collect the death mask. The death masks are these little masks that are like in the mansion. You have to collect four of them to put into that thing. But in order to get to one of them, you need to get a key from another room, which opens a door, which gives you an item, which gives you another key that gets, like the design. Okay, so uh, we're about to enter. We're probably in the best section of the game because but before I get to that, let me get back to the graphic settings of Resident Evil 1 on Steam, PC, so on and so forth. Uh, there's this thing where if you just load it up normally, depending on your computer or depending if you're playing on the Steam Deck, there's going to be this disgusting slowdown effect, which just makes everything run really, really bad. But the way you fix it is that you go into the graphic settings and pretty much change the frame rate to like variable. However, if you open up the graphic settings, the game crashes. <laughs> At least that's what happened with me, and it's also happened with a couple other people because I went online to see how to fix the issue. And the way you fix the issue is you pretty much have to go into like the INF file of this game, which I don't even know if that's like the correct letters, the INF, but it's like a text file which pretty much gives you access to the graphic settings, and there you can change the resolution to be exactly how you want it. You can change it to not open up as windowed. Yeah, every time I opened up the game normally, like when I first bought it, it opened up as a window when I wanted it to be full screen. And so you can change the setting to full screen, change the frame rate to variable, because if you don't, if you just leave it at like a lock 60, lock 30, the game just chugs, like slows down for no reason. I mean, there's probably a reason it does it, but I don't know the specifics of it. I'm not a game dev, but yeah. So I changed it to variable, and now the game runs pretty well, though sometimes when recording with OBS, there's a few areas that lag. The final area of the game, honestly, could be a bit of a nuisance. But, so, yeah, I know, that kind of covers the graphic settings. And let me just give you a little fun fact. So check out this door animation here. So, like, every time you open a door in this game, you go through this loading process where the door slowly opens. And on the PS1, you know, with the original game, there actually needed to be a reason. Th that actually needed to be there. You know, the whole long door loading animation. Because on PS1, they actually needed to load the next section of the game. But here, on the GameCube, they don't really need to do that. They just included them because when testing the game, like, they removed this door loading animation and just had the player, like, instantly load into the next area without that long interlude. However, the game played like that just kind of made the whole vibe feel weird. Like, these door sections are really necessary for this horror atmosphere. It's a very unique aspect of Resident Evil that just... It's classic, you know, like it's just not going to be the same game if you don't constantly go through these little animations, you know, it just builds the suspense. What's on the next room? What's in the next room? Like, ooh, like it's just, it's honestly kind of cozy. I mean, yeah, it is horror, but it's cozy. Also, another thing that makes Jill's path like easier is that with this shotgun with Chris, you actually need to get another item in another room to solve this puzzle. But with Jill, she has a get out of jail free card with Barry because... Once she gets the shotgun here and tries to exit the room, Barry will just automatically like bust us out. While with Chris, that doesn't happen. However, so I've done three playthroughs of this game. I played my first playthrough with Chris on the GameCube. That took about 15 hours or so. And then I played my second playthrough on the Steam Deck with Jill. Normally, that took about 12 hours or so. And on that second playthrough, I did this shotgun puzzle the way you do it with Chris. I got the fake shotgun first. I went through all that hassle. I didn't know that you didn't need to do that. You could just avoid it and just immediately get the shotgun. So there, that's another reason why Jill's path is easier per se. But yeah, the reason that you know that on the GameCube they don't need to do these loading animations is that later in the game, there's a moment where enemies will just randomly burst through doors. And when they do that, you can actually enter the area and there, there's like no loading path in between them. It's all like immediately loaded in and seamless. So the game actually like uses this, you know, long door opening animation against you. It's like, oh, you know, enemies can't go through doors. When they open a door, like that area isn't available without like a load in, but nope, that area is seamlessly encoded into the rest of the game. And of course on modern like architecture, like the Steam Deck PCs, uh, PS4, Xbox Ones, you definitely don't need to load that. In fact, I don't really think you can turn off the loading in this game, but yeah. Okay, so right now, uh, I will have to mention this is a segmented run. I pretty much like split up this run between like 10 save files. 
like pretty much I'd save I've saved 10 times throughout the game so I just finished that was my first save and on the second save is probably the most complicated section of the game like for this section of the game I actually needed to like write out my list of objectives in mind while playing this game like you know the first 10 minutes I reached the first save point that wasn't too complicated like I kind of remember what to do but for this section I actually needed to write down what I had to do in order to remember what I had to do in fact uh, in my time codes, I actually wrote out every single objective I wrote down, which helped me remember what to do in this section. So, like, for the parts where it was kind of easy to know what to do, because it was, like, maybe a linear path or just it wasn't too complicated, I just wrote down part one, part three, part four. But for the objectives that are, like, you know, for, like, the sections of game, you know, like, because you also have limited save files. You know, you have limited ink ribbons, so you can't spam saves. You actually, like, whether you're doing one of these runs or not, segmented, not segmented, like, you still have limited saves, so you can't spam the saves whenever you want. You actually have to, like, you know, space them out a bit. And in this space of time, this kind of part two, which I didn't write as part two, because instead of writing part two, I wrote down all my objectives. This is the most complicated section of the game. It's probably also the best section of the game, because, like, everything is so interconnected. And this mansion is just lovingly designed. It's like, this, this area is designed, like an actual house. You know, you have all these different ha hallways and stuff. And well, not an actual house. I don't know what person creates this puzzle house of a location as an actual house. But, you know, there's, like, architecture and stuff. You know, you actually look at the map. It's, like, a whole house map. You know, it's not linear. It's got all these, like, little non-linear non paths. Like, that's great. But we just completed the first... I just completed the first objective of this second part, which is get the dog whistle. And after we get the dog whistle, we have to go kill the dog. Now, the reason I didn't put kill the dog in my time code is I feel like if I wrote down kill the dog in my time code, this video would get banned or something or just shadow ban maybe i don't know because youtube's a little sensitive with this sort of stuff but we enter this area and this is where the dog is going to be and like this section is a little tough i'm not going to lie because sometimes the, the dogs in this game are just a really weird enemy like they just they're super fast they jump super fast they have like weird hitboxes sometimes they can kind of like latch onto you when you don't want them to latch onto you like there's two dogs here and if you're good at shooting the shotgun or know a certain gameplay tech you can kind of maybe like get the whistle before the second dog shows up but i did not no not get the whistle but get the key the fake key which that dog has before the second dog could attack you but i'm not gonna risk it i'm not gonna lie because so i pretty much exit and then i re-enter the area just to get that key and then we're good to go from there You yeah, know, that was a close one. And also this strategy, this kind of this strat I'm using for this entire video, kind of the path, the way to no damage certain things, I didn't exactly come up with. I have to shout out Carcinogen SDA, which uh, he made a video pretty much no damaging pretty much every single way to no damage Resident Evil remake and also most of the other Resident Evil games, probably all of them. But yeah, no, I was following a sort of path he took to get the good ending with Jill on real survival and also another thing about real survival is that it changes two things well three things actually one there's no auto aim so you do actually have to aim your stuff a little more precisely um the second thing is that the item boxes don't they like if you put your item boxes in one of them and then you go to another one normally the same items are going to be here but on real survival the item boxes if you put it in one area those items stay in that one area so if you go to another item box the items are not going to be there so it requires more planning and also a little bit more backtracking here and there. It adds to the difficulty. So, like, you know, you're not guaranteed to have your stuff if you're in another area with an item box. So I'm pretty sure the next objective here, I mean, I mean, you'll, you'll know what the next objective is. It'll be in the time code. It's to pretty much swap the keys here. But after that, I don't know exactly what to do after that. Like, the first time I was playing this game, not, my, not, not like on the first playthrough where I beat this game, but just when I was playing it and I got stuck. I actually got stuck at this part. This wasn't the part that made me quit the game. It might have been the part that made me quit the game. I don't know. <laughs> oh, man. But I also want to get back to those, like, door opening animations because I would do this funny little thing where every time I went through one of these doors, like, in those good couple of seconds, I would try to quickly respond to, like, a text or if I had a cookie near me. Like, every time I go through one of those doors and went through one of those, like, loading animations, like, at this point in time, I try to, like, go for, like, a cookie if I had a cookie near me and take a quick bite of it. But whenever I do this, you'd still have to be a little quick with it, so it would be like a little stressful. Because sometimes to respond to a text, I have to be really quick to respond to it before this time runs out. Because I am kind of recording a bit of a seamless run. You know, I'm not going to pause the game and like finish that text. No, I have to finish that text in the short amount of time, which 
it takes to like open this door and you know go through this whole thing and with a cookie you have to take a quick bite and then kind of wipe off any crumbs in my fingers and sometimes i don't succeed in that so i have a little bit of like uh it's not called gravy it's called like uh i have some of the cookie grease on my fingers while touching the steam deck and that's just like uh and sometimes like the crumbs would spill over the place so like i'm just playing the game it's like oh there's a little mess near me it's like oh it's, it's just a good thing i didn't try to like reach for lemonade or something because it's like this game i mean it's, it's a little stressful per se so yeah the next objective here i forget what it is but i'm gonna i'm gonna take a guess and say it's probably uh meet up with a re no it's get the grenade launcher so this first objective it, i mean this objective right now is get the grenade launcher from the grenade launcher i have to go meet richard from richard i have to go get the serum and then i have to do another thing and see like these objectives they help me think about the game what i have to do but you still have to know the area because i didn't exactly specify which area i have to go to meet richard i just kind of know because i've run this game a few times and i just have a bit of an idea of how this mansion works without constantly checking the map i will still check the map map every now and then because sometimes i get lost or i forget i have to enter a specific door or whatnot but it's like and just like the way you have to think about this game with the area the way it's designed like this chunk of the game is just fantastic and it's probably my favorite chunk of the game because the other chunks uh lean towards a bit more linearity i mean they, they have great atmosphere like this game just the what it did to the original is just fantastic just like it's a it's a fantastic looking game though the game does look slightly better on GameCube if you played on a, a CRT, though. I'm not gonna lie to you. I didn't play the original GameCube version on a CRT. I used the, like, RetroTINK uh, 5K. Or, no, no, not 5K. Like, 5X to pretty much upscale game on, like, a more modern TV. And it does look pretty nice, though. Probably not as nice as it would look on a CRT. Because, like, these pre-rendered backgrounds, like, really pop on a CRT. It would be fun to play the game on a CRT, but I don't know how I'd record it. Because just, like... If I record footage of this game and put it on YouTube, uh, that YouTube footage isn't going to be played on a CRT. It's going to be played like on a laptop or on an iPhone, you know, or like maybe you could hook up your laptop and play it on a CRT and just watch the footage that way. And it'd be pretty cool, probably. Also, I did decide to just kind of run this game in a four by three aspect ratio, not a 16 by nine aspect ratio, just because I think it made the game run slightly better. And also just for the funsies, like, hey, look at this funny little box, which I'm recording the video in. And also, since it's a Steam Deck, this footage is in 720 p but I, I was originally going to like encode this video in 1080p but oh i ran into a very uh specific me issue with that aspect of the game and right now i'm not 100 percent sure what objective i'm following right now I, I i literally do not know oh no no yes i do it's a serum also a funny thing about zombies which i didn't know until later is that so zombies they'll try to grab you but if they're on the stairs, they don't grab you. They just try to puke on you. Because sometimes I try to, like, bait a zombie to grab me while I'm on the stairs. And then they puke on me. And that's ruined a couple runs I've done of my no damage here. Which is very, very sad. So, yeah. Here we're going to go to this little save room. Drop off a few things. And I don't know if we're going to collect anything. And Oh, drop off the grenade launcher? Oh, wait. No. There's no way I'm dropping off the grenade launcher. But I guess I am. I guess I'll just use the grenade launcher for a later section of the game. But I could have sworn I used it earlier. But, hmm, guess not. But yeah, no, so the next objective I have is pretty much you know, get the serum, put away the grenade launcher, and then we're going to defeat the plant thing along the way. And the reason we're going to defeat the plant thing is that in, the in part one, we picked up like this thing which kills the plant. This, however, is not killing the plant thing. This is just a door I had to open along the way. And once again, Jill used her handy lockpick while Chris would have needed to get, would have needed to like get a key in another area. And this, this is the place where you would get the fake shotgun. So that's how you solve the shotgun puzzle with Chris. Though you don't necessarily have to do that with Jill. But in this room, there's also a battery pack. Cause, right, so you have these defense items. So whenever an enemy does grab you, in fact, I've used this, I've used this defense item before. And enemies grab me, I stab them in the face. When that happens, you don't take damage. Well, okay, so Chris, he has the knife. Jill also has a knife, but Chris has a flash grenade he just shoves in an enemy's mouth while Jill gets this battery pack where she just kind of tases the enemy. Go, <laughs> it will happen later in this video, so you will get an example of it. I'm not 100% sure if it's happened before, but yeah. We enter this room that's pretty much at the end of the hallway. We put that little bag there. It makes the water red. And since the water is red, we have to turn this valve on the red side. Now, I don't know exactly how you'd figure out that it's on the red on the first time. I mean, it's not like there's any consequence to, like, turning it green the first time and then red. You know, just kind of waste time. But there, boom. Red, we kill the plants. Which gives us access to the first death, ma death mask of the run. There it is. Boom. Yeah, no, the hunt for the death mask is just very long like non-linear you can kind of tackle it like any way you want but i've kind of set up a linear path for me to follow anyways 
So then once we kill that little plant thing, we have to go save Richard, which requires going to Richard. And in Richard's path, there, like, you know, later in that area, there's going to be a music note we can get. So we get that music note, and we pretty much exit that area. Like, there's going to be two doors in the area, like, after Richard. And one of, the, one of those areas is accessible to us, but the other one is not accessible until we solve a puzzle, which requires us to get that music note. So we have to pretty much backtrack all the way to where the fake emblem is, which I have not picked up. You have to get the fake emblem. They have to go to the piano room. You pretty much combine the music notes together, which the other one's going to be in the piano room. Then you so pretty much solve the piano thing, solve the emblem thing, pretty much. And then you solve the little clock puzzle here later on. And then once you do all that, you'll have a, the key which unlocks the other door in Richard's, like after Richard's path, which is the snake boss. Well, no, it's not. It's like the first time you meet the snake, but you won't fully kill the snake, but you will fight the snake. So you fight the snake, you get the, another mask, you get the assault shotgun, and then I go save the game on the left side, and that pretty much covers part two. As for what I'm doing specifically right now, I'm pretty sure I'm going to save Richard. So I pretty much just enter this little door here, enter that door there, and then that pretty much worked itself out. And I just want to mention that on my first playthrough where I did beat the game, I had to look up a walkthrough a couple times to solve some of the puzzles. Like, there's just certain sections where I would get stuck, and then I look up why I got stuck, and it's like, oh, you forgot to examine a specific item. It's like, oh, okay. Or it would be like, oh, uh, you didn't know that you could use your lighter to turn on a candle in a room. I got stuck in this section here because I was trying to get the notes, and it's like, why am I not getting the notes? I'm supposed to be getting something in this area. And it's like, oh, you actually have to use a lighter to light up the room in this area. I didn't know you could do that. And it's like, there's another time I got stuck where it's like in the Spencer room where it's like, oh, if you align yourself a specific way, you can actually turn on the lamp in the room. But I didn't think you could do that because I could have sworn I was right in front of the lamp. I pressed the interact button and then suddenly it just says, oh, it's too dark to see anything. So I just didn't think anything of it. But no, you could actually turn on the lamp in that specific room. We're not going to go to that room until way later in the game, like in the second mansion visit. But yeah, I got stuck on that. And then sometimes it's like, oh, you needed to solve a code so-and-so, or you needed to like put a slide over the film, and I didn't know you had to do that. It's like, oh. And on my second playthrough, honestly, I enjoyed myself a lot more just because I knew kind of all the little tricks which got me stuck before. And instead, I was just kind of enjoying the pace of the game, kind of like figuring out which rooms to open, but none of the puzzles really stuck me. And it just, I really came to really like this game on the second playthrough. And I didn't have to look up a walkthrough for anything. I pretty much tried to solve everything on my own. I Some puzzles were still kind of puzzling on that second playthrough, but I, I managed, except for one. Like the one puzzle I couldn't solve um, was kind of like the one we had to put a slide over the film to figure out a code. I still did not know how to solve that one. I just got a little tired by that point. But the rest of the puzzles on the second playthrough, I was able to kind of like jot them together pretty well. So now we got the music notes, so we have to pretty much head back to the dining area. When I think about the Resident Evil 1 remake, I think about this room, like just like this like the little reflective floor at the bottom, like this red carpet like on the stairs and they just the red carpet in like entering the house. That is beautiful. Dude. That is such a beautiful area. Just like I wanted to no damage this game because it looks so cool and I'm probably not doing the best of service by playing it on the Steam Deck and making the graphics run at medium. Like this, and also on the GameCube version, the original game, it is slightly darker, though I don't know if that's the settings on like my Retro Dink 5X or whatnot, but it's a gorgeous game. Just like the shadows and like the carpets and just like all the little choices here and there. And I do have to admit, I have not played it. Boom! We just blew that guy's head up and it's just like, boom, action scene, let's go. We're going to this piano room and it's best to kind of kill that zombie because we're going to be running through this hallway quite a bit. But, you know, it's, just, it's such a gorgeous, gorgeous game. And I just really wanted to no damage it just because like it is such a cool game. And also, this is kind of the only like really super survival horror like Resident Evil game that I've beaten because like before then... The only Resident Evil games I've really, like, played are the action-y ones. You know, like, I've played Resident Evil 4, 5, 6, the remake of 4. Like, I haven't played 1, 2, 3, or the remake of 2. And, well, I've also I've heard the remake of 3 makes it a bit more action-y. So, like, I haven't played those. I really haven't played the horror ones. I also, I played, like, a demo of Resident Evil Revelations on the 3DS. And, like, on, that game on the 3DS is gorgeous. While the ports, I guess the 3DS graphics don't really 
hold up to snuff, but playing that game on the 3DS when it came out, it's like, dude, this looks incredible. Like, that's just what I was thinking. It was, it was so awesome playing a game that looked like that clear on a 3DS. So that's pretty much my experience with Resident Evil from memory. I actually would like to go back and play the original one just because I played this remake. I am kind of used to it. So it'd be fun to kind of see how the game originally played because one charm about the original is just that like, it is way more campy. Now this game, like it's more serious, you know, like the hallways like are scarier while in the original game, they're a little bit more barren here and there. Like, I mean, it still has the, you know, the great mechanics of survival horror, having to conserve ammo, limited item space, a bit of a confusing design with the, 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 non-linear, the, non, the non-linearity and all that. And also what just happened right now is that I screwed up. I entered the piano room and I forgot to take the fake emblem with me. So like I actually had that written down in my notes and in the time code, any, anytime like I mess up the path, I kind of put a little cheeky, like little joke in there, like, nope, oops. Like, I, this is not the first, the, the, the last time I'm going to mess up while, like, doing my set path of objectives. And also, this is not going to be the last time I mess up while talking. I'm probably going to go like... So, and here I'm messing up again because I pretty much, like, inserted the gold emblem after taking the gold emblem. And I wasn't supposed to do that. I was supposed to take the gold emblem, put the fake emblem, and then exit the room. But instead, I just did this whole little loop-de-loop -loop where I put in the wrong emblem and I had to take it out again. And I had to watch that little slow animation of the door going up and down, up and down. Cause like some cutscenes in this game are skippable and some are more like you're in the game, you know, you have to see what's happening so they don't let you skip them. So you kind of have to sit through them. So here we're gonna put this gold emblem back here and this unlocks the clock puzzle. And the clock puzzle, if you know what to do, you pretty much can solve it like that. Because that's kind of the thing with like rerunning these survival horror games. Like on the first playthrough, you know, you'll be struggling with these puzzles. But on like a no damage playthrough, you pretty much automatically know the solution and you just go to that solution as fast as possible. And yeah, no, because like I got stuck on this game, but I was able to beat like the first four Silent Hill games and I had a great time with those. And honestly, like between the first three to four Silent Hill games versus this game, I think I actually prefer the first Silent Hill games, honestly, because like this game's gameplay is more punishing and maybe better, but I don't know, I just find Silent Hill one through three like more comfy to slip into. Because it's like this game, like the ammo constrictions are a lot harder while in Silent Hill like one through three, you get a ton of ammo and like yeah you still could waste it and end up in a situation where you don't have enough ammo to continue to the next section but it is a, a lot more lenient with that same with like enemy placements just exploration in general because like this game you collect an item and you have to hold on to that item to like the nearly the end of the game to like use it in a specific weird puzzle wall silent hill is more like it has like a few levels you know there's like the one level two level three level four level and like in that area you collect an item in that level you use it in that level but Silent Hill also gets a little bit more confusing than Resident Evil at some points because Silent Hill plays with, e with teleportation. <laughs> I can't think of a single area in this Resident Evil game where you enter a door and you don't end up on the other side of that door. While in Silent Hill, you'll enter one door and then end up on like the first floor if you enter from the third floor. It gets like really psychological like that. While Resident Evil is more grounded in reality. I say this as we're about to fight a giant snake called Yawn. Why is it called yawn? Because whenever it opens its mouth really big, it looks like it's yawning. And I did say we're going to defeat the snake in the time code, and in my notes I actually wrote down that we're going to kill the snake, but we're actually not going to do anything. We're not even going to make it go away. What we're going to do is uh, have our friend Richard here shoot it about 12 times, because once, it, once he does that, we pretty much get to the second phase of the fight where we can just ignore him, because we're going to take Richard's assault shotgun. Because once we have the assault shotgun, once we have the assault shotgun, we have no need to carry on with our normal shotgun. We can kind of, kind of put that away and replace it with the assault shotgun, which uh, shoots better. I think it has a higher critical rate and it holds more ammo. So whenever you come across a box of ammo with the shotgun, you don't need to hold that onto that in your inventory. You can just combine it into your shotgun because the normal shotgun, six bullets. The assault shotgun, 10 bullets. So there we go. Uh, he's done enough shots to do this cutscene, which you cannot skip. And he's sadly going to die. And he's going to, he's going to die saving us. See, he... The snake looks like it's yawning, that's why he's called Yawn. I don't know, like the names of like the boss fights in this game, they're just kind of silly. Also, another thing about the boss fights in this game is that they're honestly easier than I was expecting. Because I don't know, with these survival horror games, like this game is just 
it kind of scares me because I wasn't able to beat it. It's like, oh, what do I do if I get to this section? Honestly, I kind of feel that fear when I'm fighting boss fights in like Resident Evil 4. But in Resident Evil 4, I think it was kind of warranted because like those fights get like a little complicated with like how you have to shoot them, how to avoid damage. Because it's like, oh man, you know, because it's like you actually have to be careful in these fights. And these in the fights in Resident Evil 1, not so much. Like these fights are honestly like easier bullet sponges than I was expecting. Like. There is like a specific fight, which is still easy, but has a little bit more going on. But for the most part, these fights, you just kind of go to a place, you shoot them from there, and you're pretty much good to go. Like the snake is not hard. It doesn't do anything all that tricky. Well, in that room specifically, since I wasn't trying to shoot it, and also like it is a very tight space, and the snake kind of moves in a specific way, you have to be careful. You kind of have to, you know, see where the snake goes, if it goes left and right. Honestly, I'd say like this encounter is harder than the, the final encounter we have with that Yawn Snake. But yeah, once we kill that snake, eh, I forgot what we do. But it's in the uh, pretty much time code, so you'll be good to go. I was talking about something else. Yeah, so Silent Hill versus Resident Evil. But yeah, no, like I think I just prefer exploring and just shooting stuff in Silent Hill. And also Silent Hill, I think just... I like how it's paced better than this game, but before I talk about that, there is a difference where like Silent Hill is very psychological and like dreamy. Well, Resident Evil has always been coded more in science. So like that's what I mean when I say realistic. Like the horrors of Resident Evil are with experimentation and like organizations and the zombies, it's a virus they created, you know? While in Silent Hill the horrors are a cult created this like weird town that causes psychological rum like rummagings from like uh the from the mind of this possessed girl, or the mind of this possessed dude or you know, it's it's real fucked up like you know like cultish stuff while in silent hill no while in resident evil even when cults are involved it's still a matter of science and like we're gonna experiment to create a new weapon you know like it's that kind of horror and even in like the most recent entries they're still kind of sticking to that though they are kind of stretching the definition of science and experimentation pretty fucking thin and here we're, we're this is probably one of the most action-packed sections of zombie combat just Boom, just blasting zombies. A one, a two, and then like a three. And it's like, like and I'm just blowing up all their heads because I'm pretty much going to waste all the ammo in my normal shotgun because I'm never going to use it again. It's not like I can put that ammo. It's not like I can take out the ammo of the normal shotgun and like save that ammo for the assault shotgun. So we're just going to use the rest of it as we reach pretty much the ending of part two, which is probably the ending of the most complicated section of the game, which is probably the ending of the best section of the game. I like... I really don't want to undersell this remake because, like, the Silent Hill 1 remake is a fantastic game. But there is kind of this thing where, you know, you go through this mansion section and once you're done with this kind of complicated section, we go on more linear vignettes. In fact, that's kind of what's going to happen right now. We're pretty much headed off to the courtyard, I believe. Wait, no, I'm not 100% sure about that. But pretty much there's going to be a section where we go on a more linear path to this, like, crankety little house. And it's got great atmosphere, we're kind of a little forest, we get introduced to a really grisly monster. It's a new, like, subplot of this game. It's a really grisly, messed up monster. It's very disturbing, the lore with it. And here we're gonna get rid of the lighter, because we don't need the lighter right now. And, okay, so ink ribbons, they are limited. However, this game does a convenient thing where every time you go to, like, an area that's a little out of bounds, because like, there's the mansion where everything's in interconnected, so... You know, like, there's not that many save ribbons here, but once we, like, go outside to one of the more linear paths, once we're, there's going to be a save point there, and near that save, save point, there's going to be ink ribbons. In fact, like, near the end of the game, you're honestly going to be so stocked on ink ribbons, you don't have to worry about anything, really. But that's only at the very end of the game, because in the final area of the game, which... Oh, yeah, by the way, this game is split up into two discs on GameCube. Not on Steam, mind you. On Steam, it's, like, one seamless experience and oh okay i need to mention another thing i messed up i actually messed up something in part two where pretty much um so on my notes i mean i i added this in the time code as a cheeky little thing in my notes i included that i had to go to like the left side the left save room pretty much it was like a right save room and a right save and like a right save room so pretty much there's actually three save rooms in this game there's like the beginning one in the dining hall but the dining hall save room doesn't have an inventory box near it so it's useless <laughs> And then there's like a saving room, uh, there's a save room on the right side, which is kind of the first one you're typically bound to encounter, which has an item box. And then there's the one on the left side, which you'll encounter after, which also has an item box. And in my notes, I put it that I had to go to the left side one, but no, no you don't. So when you see that part where I go on the left side and then 
decide to not go on the left side, that's because I realized I messed up and I had to actually go to the right side save room. But while going to the right side save room, I actually had to do this puzzle before saving, but I forgot to do it. So in part three here, I had to backtrack to this section to do this puzzle. And with that puzzle, with the Fortnite specifically, where you have to like push them into place, I have never figured out the solution or trick to that room. I didn't look it up, but pretty much like every time I've played this game, the first playthrough, I just kind of like fiddle around pushing them until I solved it. I didn't know how it worked or the logic behind it. It was like I was solving a Rubik's Cube and just suddenly everything put like slid into place without me knowing the algorithm behind it. Mind you, I've never solved a Rubik's Cube in my life, and that little room is nowhere near as hard as solving a Rubik's Cube, but, you know, just a little example to kind of contextualize how I think about this sort of stuff. And on my second playthrough, same thing. I just kind of pushed the blocks around until they solve themselves. And on this third playthrough, uh, Carcinogen just kind of showed me the exact path I had to follow in order to, like, push all those blocks together so that you, it would be the quickest way through it. And here we just kind of have this, like, you know, little mini puzzle where you have to collect three bees. You need to have, like, three item spaces open. And that's another thing which makes this game more challenging than, like, a Silent Hill is that that limited item box space, it enforces the survival of the situation. Because in Silent Hill, your item box is infinite. You can hold as many items as you want. You can hold all the ammo, all the weapons, all the necessary key items to, like, solve puzzles. So that does make it easier. While here, you have to, like, be more strategic. You actually have to, like, plan things out. You know, you go from, like, a save room. It's like, okay, what do I need to bring? on this trip and also you have to like be prepared to like hold any items and also just you're not going to be fully prepared because you don't know what's ahead and uh, 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 the bee, the bee, uh. i have never been stung by a bee or a wasp in my life and i do kind of want to stick to that goal until like you know i die <laughs> i never want to go through that experience okay like some people pay to be stung by bullet bees or bullet ants i don't want to do that I i'd rather live my life not doing that i don't know what could happen that would change that fact but like okay i'm not ant man i don't have to go through that procedure but yeah no Oh my goodness. But yeah, the game on GameCube is split into two discs, but the way it's done is a little silly. Another game that's split into two discs is Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes. That's a game I actually know damaged on my channel. Uh, please do check out that video. It gets no views. And sadly, I recorded that video when I didn't have access to like my Retro Tink 5X, so the footage is a little sloppy. It's recorded in like 480p, 480i, instead of like a 720p or 1080p. I probably could have gotten with a Retro Tink 5X. Honestly, I should probably like redo my no damage of that game, just, you know, with the better graphics or whatnot, but I don't know. I already did it, and it's a long one. Maybe I should like no damage that game without getting all the dog tags, because I did, my video is one where I get every single dog tag in the game, you know, on a year, on the most, on the hardest difficulty and whatnot. Maybe I should do something where I don't do that and have just a quicker video, but eh. But yeah, the way that game splits up its discs is the same way the PS1 splits up its discs. I actually don't know if the original Resident Evil 1 was split into two discs or not. That is, that is something I'm actually very blind about. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I know what I have to do. So pretty much, like, this part three is simpler, but I'm not going to go on the linear path just yet. I'm going to collect all the death masks to pretty much use, and I'm going to fight, like, a tiny little boss fight. And every single boss fight in this game is just kind of easy. Like, the only ones that, like, can attack you in, like, a kind of hard way to avoid is maybe the spider. The spider has some properties that just make it a bit of a pain in the ass to fight without getting hit. And the final boss, which technically isn't even in this video. Oops, uh, I'll elaborate on that later. But you know, we're gonna fight this guy and as long as you have a shotgun and can fire a bunch of shots and have ammo and aren't just relying on the pistol, you should be pretty much good to go to defeat this guy and just be square. Oh yeah, also another thing I should probably mention, and probably should have mentioned it earlier in this video, is that I'm using the alternate control scheme. However, uh, that name honestly kind of oversells what it is. Because the controls I'm playing with are exactly the same except for the left stick, which... When I was playing this game on GameCube, I never even used the left stick, so pretty much... This game has tank controls. The original game on Resident Evil GameCube was only tank controls. But on this re-release on PC, PS4, Xbox One, you have an option to not have tank controls. So you can kind of just move around in pretty much four directions. The reason you would use tank controls with a game of this style is that the fixed camera angle is always changing your sense of orientation. So if you're using not fixed, like if you're not using tank controls, then when you press forward, forward means different things in like different with different camera angles but and also the tank controls enforce the survival horror aspects you can't just like dilly dally around enemies or like just duke them out as easily you have to like be very careful in the way you move 
But now with this alternate control scheme, you can use the left stick to pretty much move in any which direction you want. You don't have to wait. You don't have to do a quick turn. You just immediately turn because you have access to that. However, this alternate control scheme pretty much makes it so the D-pad is the one that still... You still have tank controls available while using the alternate control scheme. So you can alternate between the D-pad, which is tank controls, and the left stick, which is not tank controls. Also, here's a speedrun thing I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm doing it wrong because <laughs> I'm not going that fast. Is that when you're going up or down stairs, you use the tank controls, you pretty much just press forward and spam the sprint button instead of just holding it down the whole way. And spamming the sprint button means that she kind of just kind of jags up and <laughs> and it kind of makes you go upstairs and like up and downstairs faster. But I think I kind of did it wrong or I'm just missing a certain piece of tech to do it. I don't know. Just it is a speed run thing, but I'm not 100% sure if I'm doing it right. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, we pretty much defeat that boss fight to get this emblem thing, which allows us to unlock an area, which is the linear path, which is pretty easy to understand and pretty much do in like one run, kind of. Boom, blow up that zombie's head. Uh, later on, we're going. To, there's going to be an enemy that's harder to deal with than that guy there once we visit the mansion for a second time. But we'll encounter those enemies when we encounter those enemies. But wait, I didn't even explain how this game splits up its uh, areas in two discs. So, the way this splits up in two discs on the GameCube is honestly a little strange. Because you would expect it to be, oh, the first half is on the first disc, the second half is on the second disc. But... Honestly, most of the game is on the first disc. You only really need to change to the second disc once you reach, like, the last eighth of the game. So it's like, you go through, like, seven eighths of the game, more than half, more than three-fourths. Wait, yes, more than three-fourths of the game is on the first disc. And then for, like, the last eighth, it's like, yep, you need to change disc. And it's like, it is a pretty detailed area on that second disc, but it's just like, that's just the ending. You're pretty much like the first disc, most of the game. Second disc, the ending. So it's just like, whoops. So yeah, once we reach this area, we have to follow this path. So pretty much from that room, there's two paths, two linear paths. So you follow this linear path, and then you solve whatever puzzle you have to solve here. And oh, this puzzle just kind of screws me over, because like I would stop it, and I'd stop it at the wrong point. Pretty much, like the way the camera angle is facing, you pretty much have to have it face the right each time. Like there's going to be different like direction signifiers for uh, this blue one, but you pretty much have to have it face like right down. However, I'm going to mess it up like three times in a row and it's going to be utterly embarrassing for me. Oh, oopsie daisies, I have to watch this cutscene where the dog turns that way because I fucked it up. And I'm going to try to mess, not, not fuck it up this time. And guess what I'm going to do? Um, it's slow. I'm, I can solve it, right? Nope, fucked it up again. Uh, oh, I, I could not speed around this game because I'm just going to get stuck on this section here. It's like, uh, and it was about to go fast, but I finally did it correctly. So... Pretty much make the dog's face that way, and that's how you solve that puzzle. I have no idea what happens if you don't turn the dogs that way. Like, I don't know if the dogs try to kill you or if the door is just locked. Yeah, actually, I don't think anything kills you if you mess up that puzzle. It's just more that the door stays locked because, like, the dogs are seeing you. And here we have to kill these crows because these crows will fuck you up. So you kill those crows there by pointing at the camera, and then some crows are going to fly up there, kill them because we have this little metal. We earned that medal by solving the little bee puzzle, I'm pretty sure. But you don't actually need to do the bee puzzle if you don't want the revolver in this game. But if you do, it's not even a revolver, it's like a magnum or something. If you want this weapon, you need this thing. So you need to solve the bee puzzle if you want this weapon. And if you want this weapon without getting hit, you have to kill the crows. Because the crows are super aggro and it's very hard to avoid them. So just, you know, be very careful with how you handle this situation. It can be dicey. And then from here, we just kind of solve a puzzle. We have to kind of jump from item box to item. We have to jump from inventory to things to that. You know, yada, 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 yada. Oh, yeah, another thing about... So, comparing the GameCube version of this game to this remaster, uh, one, the remaster doesn't look exactly as good because they kind of had to, like, upscale the pre-rendered backgrounds. And there, some of them look pretty nice. Some of them... Uh, look a little pixely and mind you if you put the game on medium graphics of course of course it's gonna look worse than the GameCube version like the one pretty much thing that makes this game like look better than the original I mean it, it doesn't exactly look better than the original but one thing which definitely has been updated is that the 3d models do have more detail you also have access to extra costumes so you pretty much have access to like the Resident Evil 5 version of Jill and also you get access to like her Resident Evil 3 costume, so it's like a new model, they added more polygons to it or whatnot. Same thing with Chris, but having access to like Resident Evil 5 Chris in this game is the funniest thing ever because, you know, 
Chris in this game, you know, he kind, he's kind of dorky. You know, he's a little skinnier, at least compared to how he looks later in the series where he's like a complete beefcake and like super strong and like can punch boulders. And you have access to him in this remaster. So it's like... You know, how is he, is it, you have to run away from a boulder later in this game, but if you play as like the Resident Evil 5 Chris, it's like, why don't you just punch the boulder? Like, why are you running away from it? But, you know, it is nice to have those extra costumes. It's, you know, it's cute and all. However, I, I haven't mentioned it, but I'm probably playing with the worst costume Jill gets in this game. <laughs> Though, it's like, it's green. That's not her color at all. Though, in the original game, I'm pretty sure you only had access to a very few costumes. You don't, in the original GameCube version, you don't have access to like Resident Evil 5 Jill. You only have access to like, her actual costume in this game and her extra costume which is this green version so it being green you know being the exact opposite of what jill would wear is probably the actual point because with chris you know you have his green outfit and then like his alternate is red so it's like you know a uh, color theory but it's just like compared to all the alf all, all the other outfits it sucks though i'm not gonna lie the reason i didn't play with another outfit is because i didn't want to play exactly with her resident evil 5 outfit I actually wanted to play with like a Resident Evil 3 outfit, but in order to unlock that outfit, you had to beat the game two times. But on Steam, I, I beat it once, and I didn't want to run through it again. I kind of wanted to get to the no damage, so we're playing with probably her worst costume. And here we've reached the fucked up creature, Lisa. Oh my goodness, this thing is terrifying. I have to apologize, once again, the graphics are on medium, and when you put the graphics on mediums, the detail on Lisa's, like that fucked up monster's model, are like diluted a lot. Like that thing is more gruesome when you're playing the game normally. It's even more detailed on GameCube, but I put it on medium, so it's just kind of like a, a Minecraft skin of its former self. But it's still really fucked up looking. But dealing with her, okay, the way she's coded is actually, she's one of the harder enemies to deal with, because like... Most of the enemies in this game have a pretty, pretty easy way to deal with Not easy per se, it's still hard to deal with enemies in this game. Here, I'm gonna miss most of my fucking shots. Miss. Miss. And the zombie itself even- oh wait, no, the, oh, the zombie's in a weird position where like he's on an inclined plane. So like instead of grabbing me, he barfs and I really hope that barf missed. Like, Jill did not react to that barf in any way whatsoever, so I'm pretty sure it's missed. Because honestly, in this video, I have some calls where, like, I'm not even sure if I did not take damage. So, like, if this whole entire video, if I took damage at one point and never noticed, I'm going to be so sad. Because the thing with this game is that there's certain enemies where if they attack you, your health will still be green. Like, the way that your health works in this game is that there's kind of, like, there's green where it's, like, it's fine. And then there's, like, caution where it's, like, red or orange. And then there's, like, one where it's, like, orange red. And then there's one where it's, like, danger, danger, which is, like, completely red. So, but like sometimes you'll get attacked and it'll still be in green. So it's like, did I get attacked? Did I not get attacked? And it's just kind of weird like that. Also, another thing about this game. Oh, but dealing with Lisa. So like sometimes she has this thing where she'll pretend like she won't hit you if you run past her. But then you try to run past her and she'll just whoa, he'll swing full force at you and knock you to the ground. She's tricky like that. Some of the, the other enemies don't do that. But an easy way to deal with her in that specific section of the game is to just shoot her three times with a magnum. That pretty much stuns her, puts her down for a bit, and then you just run past her. So that's another neat reason to get the magnum at that point in time. And here we have two dogs. And actually at this point in this section, this is actually one of the close calls that I'm actually worried about. I'm actually not 100% sure if or if I did not take damage. Honestly, I kind of need you, the audience, to tell me if I took damage or not. But there's like two dogs here. We have to kill them because we're going to be running through this section a lot. And with the dogs, it is not a good idea to run away from them. They are faster than you. They, you need to kill them. <laughs> you need to kill them to avoid damage. Or like if there is a way to run away from them, it's not consistent because they can be real assholes about the way they jump or like try to like assault you. So there's this dog here. And also, like, just shooting these dogs is hard, too. There's, like, this speedrun trick you can do with the shotgun where, like, you shoot it and then you, like, put it down immediately or, like, unready it. I don't know how it works because I didn't do it right. And here I'm going to try to shoot this dog when it comes at me. But it jumps on me. And this is actually where I'm not sure if I took damage or not. Because, okay, so something which this game does with the way... and Because the dog grabbed me. It didn't attack me. And there actually is a difference between that. Because most of the time the dogs attack you and they deal damage. But they just jump off you. They don't grab you or, like, throw you down to the ground. See, look, I used a recovery item there, and I'm under the impression that whenever you use, like, a recovery item, like the knife or a stun thing, you don't take damage. And so I'm pretty sure that's what happened. I did not take damage from that attack. I got grabbed. And see, like, all the enemies in this game have grab attacks that can be reacted to with the knife. At least that's what, what I understand. Normal zombies, they can grab you. 
uh, re- like the red skull, the I forgot what they're called, like the the red, the crimson heads. They can grab you. Though most of the time, the crimson heads like to swipe at you, but the crimson heads can still grab you. And you can still use a recovery item to get away from that. The dogs, they can grab you. Uh, one enemy which cannot grab you are the the tiny snakes. Though I still hate these tiny snakes that show up. Okay, I don't think they're gonna show up here. They they will show up here later, but for now, not not right now. But yeah, no. The tiny snakes can't grab you. Um, okay, there's like these hunter enemies that show up later. They can also grab you, and you can get away from them by stabbing them within a recovery item. Though most of the time, those hunter items don't grab you. They just try to like swipe at you or do something else. And also, if they grab you from behind, they insta kill you. Okay, the crows, they can't grab you. That's an enemy that can't grab you. But like any enemy that is capable of grabbing you, they could grab you, and you could escape from them using the recovery item. And I'm pretty sure if that happens, you don't take damage. So here, there's some snakes are going to drop from the ground, and you can pretty much avoid them by running away from them. But there's going to be very specific, very annoying sections of this game where a snake will be positioned in such a way where if you just mindlessly run away from them, they're going to jump you it's like a, a cod camper they're just waiting to just and it's terrible that is a camera angle that is never going to show up again that low pov it only shows up when you enter the house and never again that whole little psychological horror Ooh, this game can get psychological too but in a more sciencey way Ooh, ah. It's funny, this game is called Resident Evil, so you'd assume you'd go to a residence that's evil, and like, that that's the mansion, right? But then you get to this section of the game, and you know what this section is called when you look at the map? It's called The Residence. This is the only part of the game that is The Resident Evil. Ooh, I mean, yeah, the mansion is also a residence, but like, this is the only area that's like called Resident by name. And like this, for this little area, it's not exactly linear, it's just kind of tiny, so you know, it's not as complicated as like the big mansion, which has so many different rooms, and like one key opens another door all the way on the other side of the map, while here, there's not that many doors to explore, you know, like you, you pretty much like solve it here and there. There's like a few tricky puzzles, but it is a pretty small area per se. I mean, it does connect to like a bigger area, like the spider, okay, so like having a giant spider is such like a goofy concept, you know, it's like, ooh, a giant spider, but like, man. They're so creepy in this game. Like, I don't know. I mean, like, they're also funny, but it's, it's a giant spider. Like, the way it's just hanging on the door. I mean, maybe I have a bit of spider phobia. I don't. But, like, um, dude, look at that thing. It's like the way it just kind of, like, taunts you after doing an attack. It's like, I mean, spider, the tarantulas do do that. I guess they're technically tarantulas or whatever. But, like, oh, man, there's just something so unnerving about them. They're too big. <laughs> like, make them smaller. Oh, my goodness. But, yeah, no. Uh, so there's something like quirky going on in this residence so you do need to push this box because like there's a plant that's alive that's kind of like crawling around in the house so it can kind of like choke you whenever you cross this path and you do deal damage you, you, t you do take damage from that so you pretty much have to use this box to kind of do a little oh super mario that this has nothing to do with super mario tomb raider eh, i don't know now, the outfit you're wearing is pretty similar to like laura croft's outfit no lie but, yeah, what's fucked up about this residence is that later on you're going to be encountering some sharks. But you don't really need anything for this section of the residence. All you really need is to collect the puzzle pieces and also have some recovery items to deal with any zombies that you want to put down. There's going to be, like, a zombie later on in this section. Oh, wait, actually, no. What we're going to do here is... It's actually a very tricky thing. So you pretty much enter this room. And once you enter this... This is actually the room which allows you to go meet the sharks and all that. But you pretty much have to enter this room, you collect an item, and then you wait a bit or try to like walk around this door to summon a zombie into this room. Ah! There's a zombie, see? Ooh, scary, scary. And the reason you want to summon the zombie in this room is that you pretty much put him down with a recovery item because if you don't summon this zombie into this room or wait for him to enter this room, he's going to be in this room. We're never going to enter that bathroom again, but we will be entering that room a couple more times. So if the zombie's waiting for us here, we're gonna have to deal with him multiple times. Well, if we lure him into the bathroom, he's going to be stuck in the bathroom and he never attacks us again. So yeah, we pretty much get a key from there, which unlocks the door all the way on the other side over here on the left side. That's kind of something important to remember. That the door, the door we have to unlock is on the left side of this hallway. Once again, we have to jump on these little boxes because the save room is on the right side. Like with this section, you know, it's like part, what, four, five, six, seven, I forget. But pretty much, 
door on the right side is save room. Door on the left side is a room you unlock by pretty much opening this key. And when you enter this room, what you really want to do is not enter the door on your right. You actually want to run up all the way over here and get the little like one shot mini revolver, which pretty much like this self defense gun pretty much kills any enemy except for boss fights in one shot. Cause it pretty much is like a slightly stronger magnum, but it only has the one bullet. So it's like, ooh, when do we use this one bullet? We will be using it later. And then we enter the bathroom, because if you enter the bathroom first, what's going to happen is that the, the zomb there's going to be a zombie waiting for you while you're trying to get the self-help, the, the self, self-help, <laughs> fucking hell, the self-defense gun. Um, well, if you get the self-defense gun first, the zombie won't be there to attack you, because pretty much you can get the self-defense gun, get whatever you need to get, to get, get the key in this room, and then you can exit the room without having to deal with the zombie that will be waiting for you you know, in the other part of the room. And then we don't revisit this room because we pretty much exhausted everything we had to do in this room. And then we have to return to the room that lets us, I'm pretty sure we have to return to the room that lets us meet the sharks. And the thing about meeting the sharks is that once again, I mentioned before, you don't really need anything for this section of the residence. Like normally what I would do because I was following like carcinogens like path is that I carried my shotgun and revolver, but on a new attempt while I was like failing it, I decided, you know what, I'm going to put those away but, you know, so I can carry more stuff. However, putting away the shotgun and revolver causes a new problem. The sharks actually attack you when you don't carry your shotgun and revolver in your inventory. So, like, I mean, I did it twice, and every time I did, like, on those two attempts, when I wasn't carrying my shotgun and revolver, I got attacked. So I decided to just kind of keep my weapons in my inventory, and then the sharks didn't attack me. Because, like, normally, every run I did, I carried my shotgun and my revolver, and the sharks never attacked me. So I just assumed if I got rid of the shotgun and revolver in my inventory, it would be the same deal. But no, the sharks actually try to chase you and deal damage to you. And it's just weird. Is it, is it like a weight thing? It's like, oh, if you're carrying, like, the shotgun and revolver that adds weight in your inventory, so the sharks get a little scared. Like, oh, she weighs a little bit too much. Ooh. Well, if you don't, it's like, oh, she doesn't weigh at all. Let's killer ah! it's such a weird thing to like you know affect in this game but it does affect it so when you're dealing with this section just carry your two weapons and it's more likely that those sharks you have to run away from won't attack you and well a more safe way to deal with it is just to shoot the sharks and kill them but why deal with that when you can just run away from them because it's like oh i'm just gonna run away from them because that works but that only works if you're carrying the shotgun and revolver, and I'm not even sure if it works 100% of the time, but for me, it has. Because the, the thing with Carcinogen is that, like, his run is no saves. It is not a segmented run. It is, like, a one-go. He does the entire game without being hit. While me, I'm doing a segmented run. So I just kind of took his non-segmented run and added segments to it. So that's pretty much the way I'm dealing with it. And here, we're just dealing with this very time-consuming, like, block-pushing puzzle. I really love the music in that previous room, you know, it's like oddly calming, you know, like oddly satisfying. <laughs> but yeah, this room, even th like when I was first playing through the game, I was actually a little surprised I was able to just run away from the sharks. I was expecting them to be more of a threat, but no, you can just run away from them. Because like, what they do is that when you carry the weapons, they just kind of turn away from you. But if you don't have the weapons, they just rush straight at you. They just go in a straight line. While here, they do a little curve away from you every time they get kind of close to you. But another, but even when I was able to run away from the sharks easily, I still kind of had the, the heebie-jeebies because I saw Super Bunny Hop's review of this remake, and he mentioned this thing where an invisible timer starts whenever you enter that area, and when the timer runs out, a giant shark just comes and insta-kills you, and that's like one of the only insta-kills in this game because there's a difference between this game and Resident Evil 4. In Resident Evil 4, you can die very quickly because the combat's always happening it's very intricate you know you have to shoot the zombie or else he'll deal huge damage to you in a huge amount of time but in order to compensate for that save points were very close by at any point you know like there's a save point every like five or so minutes in resident evil 4 while in this game the save points are very spread out but you don't die quickly per se because there isn't that much combat in this game like combat is rare it is deadly but you only have to deal with like one enemy and you can kind of avoid it, maybe go to another room, while in Resident Evil 4, combat is the main focus and it's always kind of happening. So, save points are closer, while combat in this game is more a rare occurrence and something you can kind of prepare for. 
and you know, it's not really so much about skill but more resource management so save points are more spread out so if you die after 30 or 40 minutes of progress it's not because of some weird insta kill thing it's because you know you didn't plan well enough while in Resident Evil 4 there's a bunch of insta kill stuff but yeah the only insta kill thing in this game is that big shark so here we have to kind of like manage a couple things in a weird way you have to go to like the computer in the middle of the room and then once you deal with that that starts this whole panic process and you go to like the computer on the right of the room then you go to the computer on the left of the room and then you have to go change the oil which the oil thing is the first pipe and then after you deal with the first pipe you have to go to the computer on the right then the computer on the left and then you go back to the middle computer and that solves the section green light kiwami we go from there uh, there was another thing I wanted to mention, I forgot. So yeah, in the Super Bunny Hop review, it's like, I knew there was a shark, I knew there was a timer, I knew there was an insta-kill, I didn't know exactly in what context I'd have to be worried about that. And what I've realized is, I run through that little section so quickly that I never had to really worry about it, but if you like meander in that section, a giant shark does try to like, does jump out of nowhere and try to chomp you to death. And in fact, we're gonna meet that shark right now. We've drained the water, so the shark, he does, he's not as strong as he could be, you know, as he used to be, but he is here. So yeah, that is an... That is something you have to worry about in that big watery room. Run through there quickly or else a giant shark comes and kills you in one shot. So I mentioned that Jill's costume here is probably the worst, but I think the results screen you get when you like beat this game in a really fast time, and I do get this exact results screen I'm referring to. In fact, I'm going to make this results screen the thumbnail of the commentary version. She does the goofiest fucking pose. It's fucking it's funny as fuck. Like, I love it. So that kind of redeems this costume for me. It's just like fucking campy ass, goofy ass pose she does when you get good results at the end of the game. And I will get those results, so you get to see what I'm talking about. And also in the thumbnail, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. So here, there was a speed run thing you could do where you jump off immediately and run to the left, but I didn't want to risk it. And also, I just kind of wanted to show the animation of Big Shark here getting electrocuted to death. And boom, look at that. We stole the key, and it's kind of scary because, you know, like, you have to deal with the big insta-kill shark, and then you kill the shark, and then you have to get the key right next to its body. It's like, ooh, and, like, sometimes this shark kind of flops around. Uh, but, yeah, no, so I do think I like the classic Silent Hill games over the classic Resident Evil games, so I haven't played the classic Resident Evil 2 or 3 yet, so I do plan on it, you know, I would like to maybe do a thing I did with Metal Gear Solid, where like, I no damage all, all the Metal Gear Solid games, and eventually I think I will no damage all the Resident Evil games, because they're awesome games, they're not gonna get any views, I don't know, like, these videos, I don't I think, I think, don't think anyone really cares for me to like no damage, I mean, people care, I, I, I do hope you're enjoying this video, and also, uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we did reach 8,000 subscribers. That's awesome. Like, I don't know, just... It's incredible that, like, this thing just kind of keeps growing and growing. So I'm very, very thankful for that. And I'm not really making this video for views anyways. I'm making this video because this game is dope as fuck. And I'd love to know damage. It just kind of, to you know, kind of contribute to that and add commentary to that. You know, because, like, someone's going to come across this video and be like, Hey, why did he do commentary on this? Because the game is dope and deserves to be played. Like, it's so cool. I need to have a video with this game. Because, like, look at this. Just, oh, man. Some games are too cool to ignore. And, it, like, you know, some of this is kind of contextual to me. Like, I don't know, sometimes I'll no damage something like Ice Age 2 because, like, it's from my childhood. And I think that's cool. But, like, this game, oh, it's classic. Dude. Look at this. Oh, my God. Like, I just hope that the hour or so of this video that you've seen so far have convinced you to play this game. Because it's fantastic. It, it really is a great game. But there was something else I wanted to mention. I forget. So yeah, I guess I'll just continue. Oh, so this section is a little tricky. You have these bees that are flying around. So you have to run around this area very fast. Pick up the like the insecticide spray and then run immediately to the door. Do not waste time because if you dilly-dally, the bees will catch up to you and damage you. And this is one of those enemies where once they hit you, your, your health bar is still on green because it's a small enemy. It doesn't deal that much damage, but still, you did get hit. So don't get hit in that little animation. And here you have to watch out not to pre not to like double tap here. You pretty much have to take a map. You kind of have to go through a little bit of text they send you, but don't press again because if you inspect the hole, yeah. A after this, do not inspect the hole. You know, use this item. So if you inspect the hole again, the bees come out of the hole and kind of do a little jump scare. It's like, oh, but yeah. Pretty much once we do this, we've dealt with all the bees in that little area. It's like the bees. That's like. They're, they're like a timer thing. You have to run away from them really fast or else they attack you. And I've screwed up a couple attempts because of this. So the reason I wanted to get rid of like my shotgun and revolver, you know, because you don't need them per se, aside from like the sharks and whatnot, which I didn't know about. But yeah, you don't really need them. We have the code here. There's a funny thing actually happened with this code while I was trying to like uh, no damage this game, you know, do a little residence run. 
So, yeah, no, like, I was getting back from watching the new Mission Impossible movie, The Dead Reckoning Part 1. It was pretty dope and all that. And on the car ride home, I actually brought out the old Steam Deck and attempted to no damage the Resident Evil remake. Like, specifically this section in the residence all the way to the second mansion visit. And I was doing pretty good. Like, I mean, the car ride was kind of long. It was, like, 40, 50 minutes. So, like, I had time to do the entire residence and get to the save point, which I wanted to reach in like the second mansion visit but then i reached like this part with this part with the door and i thought the code was 356 so i inputted that code but i was actually wrong so like i was recording and like i messed up and i was worried that i would have to start over again but then i quickly messed around with like the number places number placements and i very quickly realized that the right number was actually 369 365 so like I saved my own no damage run. However, this was completely pointless because that's not the footage you're seeing right now because the footage I'm talking about is one where I actually failed because I reached the house and then I was at the section where we had to run past the snakes and one of them bit me. So like, ah, uh, like, uh, so like that on the fly solution I did during the recording was completely pointless. So like it's like it would have been so cool to include in the video because it's like hey ingenuity I was able to deal with me messing up a slight thing but no uh, this is you're just gonna have to see the run where I know the right code and input it on the first try so it's like <sighs> I, I did the run again and I got clipped at the exact same part with the snake uh, and then I learned how to avoid getting damaged by the snake and it was easy, you pretty much have to like shoot it with a shotgun and I managed to like no damage that section except that when I reached the save point, you know, the final save point of part 2 I forgot to bring back the crank from the item box of the residence so like this is where real survival fucked me, okay? Because I left the crank and some save files, some ink ribbons, back at the residence so if I saved at that exact point, I'd have to backtrack all the way to the residence to get the crank because I need the crank to get to the next section of the game after the second match and visit <sighs> so i had to redo the entire thing because i forgot the two important items in that fucking item box so when you're leaving this residence do not forget to revisit the item box and pick up any items you left behind if you're playing this on real survival like uh, <laughs> so right now i kind of mixed a concoction and what from what i remember you do have to remember a specific like a concoction order pretty much red with water, then you mix that with yellow after you mix the red with water. And once you do that, you mix yellow with water and then you mix that with the previous one you have there. And then once you mix those concoctions together, you mix that concoction with red and that gives you the concoction, the brown concoction you need to kill the plant. And the thing is, once you pretty much kill this plant with this concoction, you don't have to fight the boss fight, the plant boss fight, which Okay, I mentioned the boss fights are pretty easy in this game. This is actually like the one... The plant boss fight is probably the hardest boss fight in the game to no damage because you actually have to be very careful with your positioning because, you know, you can't be too close to the plant or it'll grab you. But if you get too far away from it, uh, one of the plant's like poison sectors will poison you. So that's actually one of the trickier fights in the game you have to really kind of plan for and have like a plan for. Because like with the other boss fights, you can kind of run around them and shoot them and it's all good and fun and funny games. But the plant is probably the hardest fight in the game and... I, it, I'm just glad I don't have to fight it as Jill as long as I do this because like with Chris you can do this But you still have to fight the plant in the end I think because like at least here once again Barry saves our ass from having to deal with anything too complicated Like normally you just kind of shoot it with the magnum and be positioned in such a way where you don't get hit by the poison or by the plants vines And that's how you deal with it But it is probably the hardest fight in the game to no damage compared to the rest of the games you have the spider which Spider has some weird attacks which are kind of hard to avoid and also sp the spider has this thing where if you explode it, it'll explode acid and you have to be out of range of the acid and also like there's like another little spider in the area you don't necessarily have to kill but it can damage you. And also I'm being told that the, the tiny spider that spawn away from the carcass of the big spider can damage you which I didn't know that so there's also another thing you have to avoid. And then there's like the final boss, Tyrant, which, you know, he has some tricky patterns you have to run around, but once you know those patterns, he's not too hard to deal with. But, you know, I'm being a little disingenuous, and I'll explain my disingenuity at the end of this video.
I've been trying to further explain why I like the Silent Hill games more than Resident Evil Remake, but like, I don't know, the point I'm trying to like say is a little weird. I don't know how to word it. But I just feel like the Silent Hill games just kind of climax better, but that's probably just because the Silent Hill games, I think, have more engaging stories and also just a more psychological. Like, the second and third games, I just, I love those games. I love the cutscenes in those games. And the thing with Resident Evil is the cutscenes are, mm, how do we say, not, not that good? I mean, okay, so like, in the original game, they were campy as fuck, because, like, the voice acting was done, like, by new talent and the no it's not so much like the voice actors themselves but also just the direction it was it wasn't the most important part of that game they were focused on like gameplay and you know inventing survival horror so when they went to like the cutscenes and the voice acting and maybe some of the writing <laughs> and the localization too so that was a whole fucking mess so then we get to this remake and it is more professional with this sort of stuff like you know the cutscenes like the models they look more realistic they're like staged better you know, the localization is more accurate to, like, the original Japanese text and all that. And the voice actors are a little bit more experienced, they're directed better, it's more natural, but it's still a bit campy. Like, I don't know, these aren't exact. I mean, like, they're, they're... It's still, like, a little campy, but nowhere near as campy as the original. It's just a little... A slightly bit off-kilter, I don't know. But it's not, it's not terribly engaging, I, I don't know about you, but... Like, Resident Evil 1's does still have a bit of an interesting story, but it's mostly told through the notes, through, like, the little diaries you pick up and whatnot. While with, like, the Silent Hill games, I just feel like the base, the main story is still very engaging to follow. And Silent Hill also has, like, little notes you can read that add so much lore and context to interpret and work through and all that. And I just, like, I feel the way, like, the, those games climax together, the way the narrative and, like, the gameplay works, I just, I just prefer the way that those games handle it because, like, I feel like by the end of the first Resident Evil here, like, the final area is just kind of feels like an ending. You know, like, all right, we're here. We're finishing the game. You know, like, the most interesting sections are, like, those interconnected mansion visits. While with these Silent Hill games, the final areas are the most fucked up, like, non-linear, like, teleporty shits in the game. While the final area in this first Resident Evil just kind of feels like another linear section. And it's not really one of my more favorite linear sections. It's like a, it's kind of like another residence, another tiny, slightly non-linear sort of thing you have to solve. With, like, some neat things here and there, you know? Like, you do get some explanation, some, like, finality to the game. You get to encounter the final experimented thing. You know, you figure out, oh, Wesker! But you know, this remake is mostly pretty serious until you get to one of the cutscenes, and it is just kind of eh, schlocky here and there. Because I don't know, I'm just thinking like the ending of Silent Hill One. You know, like oh, you revisit that one area, but it's all fucked up, and like the and you follow, you fight that really fucked up final boss. The ending of Silent Hill Two is like oh, ending of Silent Hill Three. Oh. Okay, so like the one thing I am not confident in saying is whether Silent Hill 4 is better than Resident Evil 1 Remake. It's not. <laughs> it, it really isn't. Like, I think I prefer the first three Silent Hill games over this Resident Evil 1 Remake, but the fourth game? That's my least favorite of the first four. And also, it's just kind of fucked up and the structure gets a little too backtracky for its own good. There might be an argument to be made that the fourth game is scarier than Resident Evil 1 Remake? I, I don't know about that. Like, I mean, Silent Hill, whether you like it better or worse than Resident Evil, I think in terms of raw spooks, I think Silent Hill does kind of beat Resident Evil just because, like, they really get spooky with it. And here there's a dog we have to be careful for on the way back, so we have to shoot the dog down. And also the sound they use there is for monkey. They sample the monkey noise instead of a dog noise. So when you shoot the dog, it makes a monkey noise. So uh, that's that's peculiar. Silent Hill 4 has also done... No, the Silent Hill series has also done weird things with monkey sounds. In fact, I think they they did the same thing where they use like a monkey noise when you kill one of the dogs in Silent Hill 4, but I'm not 100% sure about that. I guess just sampling monkey noises was kind of a thing for these popular Japanese survival horror games. Monkeys are fucking terrifying. You know, you see a chimpanzee rip someone's face, that is fucking horrid, all right? Okay, so here we go. We reach this section. We get past one of the snakes. There's a snake in that little corner. We kill that snake. And then we're pretty much good to go to run away from the snakes. And then we're going to return to this little, like, walking area here. And uh, there's going to be another snake, which you have to, like, s pretty much avoid using a different, like, strategy. And it's just like, oh, dude, it's just... That snake got me so many times and drew in, like, so many runs. Because, like, the way my save files are split up, I have to pretty much, like, play these sections for, like, 20, 30 minutes. Which is definitely easier than trying to no-damage this entire game in one go, but it's still hard. Like, oh my goodness, like, 20, 30 minutes, it's hard. Because when you fail, 
you have to do another 20 30 minute run and if you fail multiple times boom you spent three to four hours like trying to beat this like she's like this video is two hours and 25 minutes but <laughs> that's not what my playtime on steam says i mean mind you i did do a first playthrough on steam that took about 12 hours or so so you know there's the first 12 hours but now my play times are like 25 hours and mind you like that's not that's from like the third playthrough that's like what 13 hours spent trying to make this two hour and 25 minute video because you know just ooh, a lot of work goes into this and like this is a pretty short game which i don't mind because this game is kind of built on replayability so you know like you'll run you'll do a run as jill but then ooh, there's chris's path he has slight differences go play as chris and now you kind of know the mansion better so you can navigate the game better you're getting a faster time and it's like ooh, better results and then once you do that you unlock new weapons to use in a new run or you unlock the invisible enemy mode it's like ooh, invisible enemies honestly sounds kind of terrifying has anyone ever no damage this game with invisible enemies on i feel like that would be kind of impossible unless you have a very 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 specific plan i don't know so yeah, we're gonna reach this section here, and I also screwed up this section before while running this game, and it was very frustrating. I got hit by that guy one time on one of my runs, and I wanted I did not want to cry. I wanted to break the console in half, but with my Steam Deck, if I break it in half, I mean, it, I don't know where I was going with that. Pretty much, you have to kill that guy with the one-hit kill revolver thing. Then you use the actual Magnum thing, and sometimes it'll kill it in one hit, and sometimes it won't. So if it doesn't, use the shotgun to pretty much clear out the second guy. Because we're going to be returning to the save room quite a bit, so it's best if these uh, silly little hunters are dead and put down on the ground and all that. And here we're going to reach the second most complicated section of the game, because this section also required me to write down my objectives. Another difference that real survival brings, which I think I forgot to mention, is that every time you save, the text is in blue. That was just because like the real survival mode is based on a prototype version of the game where they the game was harder but they changed it in the final product just because players didn't like it but this prototype version was kind of originally how resident evil was going to play with these little additions where the item boxes aren't connected there was no auto aim so on and so forth so yeah that's that's pretty neat also i do keep mentioning silent hill i was actually in the process of doing a no damage run of the first silent hill but then I kind of stopped it because I wanted to release it on Halloween, but it was going to take longer than that, and I kind of got fed up with the game, so I stopped it. But I did record footage of No Damaging Silent Hill 1, but then I deleted all that footage, so whenever I do return to No Damaging that game, it, I'm going to have to redo whatever I did. I got to, like, the school, and then I stopped. So, yeah, so on and so forth. I do want to do the Silent Hill games. I love those games. Love to No Damage them someday, though. The only issue with that is that Silent Hills 2, 3, and 4 are expensive as fuck. I mean, Silent Hill 1 is also expensive as fuck, but I kind of have the PS3 version. And also, I feel like emulating Silent Hill 1 probably isn't too hard compared to the PS2 games, because with the PS2 games, a bunch of shadows and shit get involved, and it's just like, Ugh. I do own Silent Hill 2 and 3 on PC, which, mind you, at this point, you don't necessarily have to own them. You might as well just pirate them and crack them and mod them so that they can actually run good on PC. Which, mind you, you do need to like, kind of crack them around. Silent Hill 2, especially, isn't a very good PC port. You kind of have to fuck around with it to make it an actual good PC port. And that's probably the only way I'm going to play them because playing the original PS2 games is kind of impossible. Because when I bought Silent Hill 2, it was like 40 bucks back in like what 2014, 15, 16. But now they're 100. Now it's fucking 140. I hate fucking like the old game market. They fucking scalp the shit out of everything. Also, in this section, so most of the time, uh, when you transition between areas, there's a long loading screen behind it. But in this one, this one's pretty instantaneous. This is like one of the only instantaneous transitions. So this is one of those transitions where you do not want to grab a cookie because you're going to have to immediately run after doing that little transition. But yeah, no, so there's the first mansion visit, which is probably one of the most complicated, best parts of the game. But then there's also this second mansion visit, which is still complicated, which is why I still have to type down my objectives to remember where to go. Like, you know, I had to write a second note for this section specifically. So, like, I was playing and recording the game on my Steam Deck while I had my laptop open looking at my own notes with my own objectives. Like, this is a non-linear game, but I had my linear set path to follow. And one of the first objectives here is I have to turn on the power, which is right after this zombie. So I decapitated him. And, yeah, there we go. So, wait, there's something else I wanted to mention. So... The thing about the objectives I set for myself is that I actually cut my list short and saved before I finished my last objective in this part because the last thing I had to do, because like, 
the last list of things I had to do was very easy to take damage. So like it wasn't easy. The, the couple last things I had to do with my original objectives was actually pretty hard. So like this section is mostly easy except for some of the final things I had to do. Because like there's a lot of really, like this second visit to the mansion has a lot of very difficult choke points. Like those hunters, they do not fuck around. So like I was getting kind of sick of it. So originally my final like the save point i'm trying to reach here was originally going to be underground in the courtyard but i instead saved inside the mansion before heading to the courtyard so i pretty much finished everything in the mansion i saved inside the mansion and then the rest of the part would be me going to the courtyard and saving in the courtyard too so i kind of you know i was kind of getting a little sick of it i was kind of having a little bit of a headache so i made my path here a little easier so i turned on the power and from what i remember i now have to get a battery which is going to be important for the next linear section of the game when it comes to these recovery items i was expecting to be more strategic with them but honestly for most of this run i kind of just free balled it also there's a fun thing you can do where if you use a recovery item and then land a headshot and their head explodes you can like recover your recovery item if it's a knife i'm not sure i don't think you can do that with the electrical like recovery items i think that's kind of like a one and done and same thing with the flash grenade because the thing with the chris's flash grenades is that they explode and once they explode it's not you can like recover them or anything but with the knives, if you stab someone in the head and they're still standing, and then you blow up the zombie's head, then you can recover that knife. But yeah, I was expecting like a bit more strategic like use of the knife. Like I was kind of thinking like, oh, certain enemies in this game, I will definitely use the knife. But honestly, I kind of freeballed it a bit more. Like I don't know. Like instead of like having specific enemies, I would knife. Sometimes I would avoid those enemies. Sometimes I would blow those enemies' heads open. And sometimes I'd use the recovery item since you do get a decent amount of them throughout the game. Like, you know, don't be careless. Like, you definitely can run out of them if you just, like, recovery item every single zombie you encounter. And then there kind of comes a point where you have to deal with the crimson heads and they're not a guaranteed grab. Because, like, the zombies in this game, the normal ones, are for the most part a guaranteed. They grab you. You can use a recovery item. The crimson heads, sometimes they just like to swipe at you. And sometimes they will grab you and you can recover from it, but it's best not to tempt fate like that so but yeah no my objective is kind of for this section part the second visit of the mansion is restore power get the battery i've gotten the battery then once i get the battery i'm going to go to the, the left save room like i am correct this time and get the grenade launcher we left it here so we're gonna get the grenade launcher i don't know if i drop off the shotgun or not i may drop off the shotgun here uh just just cause because right now we don't need the shotgun oh actually i'm gonna do something a little bit a little bit funny what i'm going to do is normally you okay so i mentioned before you can't split ammo from the shotgun and have it as your own supply but with the grenade launcher since the grenade launcher has different ammo types like acid and flame if you combine the acid rounds into the grenade launcher then you can actually rip out the grenade the normal ammo from the grenade launcher and that can be its own separate ammo and what i do is i pretty much like put the acid rounds into the grenade launcher i get rid of the normal grenade launcher rounds i leave them in that little item box so they can actually carry the shotgun with me i do this for a kind of specific reason which is for later but yeah my next objective after i do this is i have to get the red and yellow diamonds they're both in this room it's a little neat puzzle and also like uh there are items i avoid so since this is a no damage run i can avoid picking up healing items which mind you is a huge saver for my inventory because those healing items take up so much space in the inventory but since i'm never going to get hit i don't need them so i'm pretty much good to go there but yeah, pretty much have to turn off the lights. They need to kind of like guide this purple eagle away from the one you're going to get. So pretty much you have to rush over here, jump on this little crate, grab the yellow diamond. And then once we, we have to get this like purple eagle's attention here, you know, like fully get him there and then run all the way to the red diamond. Oh, and I yeah, pretty much run up there, quickly grab the red diamond for the eagle spots. Because if the eagle spots you, then you can't pull it out. It's like stuck in place. And then once you complete this objective, you have to use the yellow diamond on the lion. Now, there was actually a blue diamond, which I have not gotten because it wasn't part of the carcinogen run. But pretty much what the blue diamond does is that you, you, you use it on the lion and it pretty much gives you extra shotgun shells. But you don't necessarily need that for this run. So you can actually avoid getting the blue diamond altogether, which is a really funny thing because it, it's one of the first items you can get. You have to like push the statue off like the top part of the dining room area. And it's like, ooh, you have a blue diamond. When are you going to use it? Oh, you have to wait until you can reach this lion here. And you don't necessarily need to use it because those extra shotgun shells aren't 100% necessary. But they're there if you want them. But, you know, it's like you don't know the exact importance of some of these items until you have to use them and have further context for it. But you only really need the yellow diamond to get this MO disc. 
And honestly, I don't even know if you need this MO disc to get a bad ending, is the other thing. So it's like, even this yellow diamond is kind of optional. So it's like, ooh. As for whether I get a good ending or bad ending, I'll further elaborate on that later. But once you use the yellow diamond on the lion, now you have to get the get a box in another room that uses the red diamond. And now since I have kind of like a spatial awareness of where I am, that red diamond is kind of like, you know, in the main hall with the beautiful red carpet, it's in the door that's to the top right. So you, on, the, on the first floor, on like the bottom floor there. So you have to go to that room. That room is going to have the red box, which gives you a little, gives you a whack-ass puzzle, which you have to solve, which is just very finicky and weird. And you kind of like shape things together, like another Rubik's Cube sort of thing, but not, not as hard as a Rubik's Cube. But once you get that box that gives you the red diamond that you solve, and then you get a key from that, then we're going to fight the snake and actually kill the snake this time. And once you kill that snake, we have to go to like the left side save room again to pretty much sort things out, kind of get some revolver ammo we left behind. And that section is hard because you have to deal with the hunters and the hunters are positioned in such a way where it's like, it's kind of hard to shoot them and it's very stressful. And I messed up so many times in that section that I decided that for my next objective, you have to go to the right the right side save room, drop off the ammo disc, drop off the red and blue book, which you will have, and the grenade launcher, get the crank, because you will be returning to the right side save room for when you actually need those items. And then I decide to save there instead of saving later on in the game. Because my normally the objectives I had was, I wouldn't save there, I'd save later. I pretty much like the next three objectives, which are not in the time code because I don't include them in this section is I have to go to the Spencer room and pick up the metal. And then from there, I have to go through the, the forest area again and use the battery and then go to the save point underground. That's just gonna be part of the next part. It's not gonna be part of this part. So those objectives are not time coded, but if I did do those objectives in this section, I would have included them in the time code, but for right now, yeah, we're going to solve this whack-ass puzzle. And it's just like, you can fuck around with these pieces in a kind of creative way, but what I kind of do here is get the big one there, place it near the bottom, you know, rotate it. You have to like kind of fit it there. You just really squish it down there. And it doesn't have to be a perfect fit. The game kind of tricks you into thinking it has to be a perfect fit because like it's kind of a pain in the ass to fiddle with it, but it doesn't have to be perfect. So get that one that's kind of in the middle. Then you kind of flip this one around. Yeah, fiddle around with it. Just and adjust the piece. Yeah, just gonna shove it up in there. Shove it near there. I don't know. Like there's gonna be a bit of empty space. And then from here, you can ha you have to shove this one kind of there. You know, yeah. And then you get this one, and then it solved itself, and it's just a disgusting little puzzle. And if you don't know how to solve it on the first time, it could kind of take a while to fuck around. See, like, you really have to fiddle around with it because it's a very, like, tight space where that thing fits. And then, boom, there's the key that opens up a Spencer door, and that's the only door it opens. And then now we're going to go kill the snake. Now I don't know exactly what to talk about, but the path we're taking here is kind of like the path we took in the, be in the beginning of the game because the final uh, snake boss fight is, you know where we have to swap the keys? That's where it is. So, and it's also a pretty easy path to follow. Okay, so this room, no enemies ever really show up in this room, but this is such a cool room. All the camera angles, you got the bird cage, you got the crows, all the shadows playing everywhere. Really love this little section of the room. It's just like, the, the fixed camera angles allow like, the game to like direct itself and just like every scene is like tightly knit and directed like every angle is the one that you exactly have to see it, it really is a great atmosphere to it so yeah you pretty much just run past here because in that little room the room the one we just exited from has a crimson head it's like one of the only crimson heads which isn't caused by you because okay what a crimson head is if you shoot a zombie and it's not a headshot and if you don't burn the body then it will re it'll pretty much like revive itself later on as a tougher zombie that has more attacks is faster and more aggressive and deal with more damage so it pretty much incentivizes you not to kill so many zombies or to go for a headshot or to burn specific zombies in specific places because you're not always going to get a headshot with a zombie so you will end up in a situation where if you kill enough zombies uh, one of them will be killed in such a way where they'll become prison head later so you know it kind of forces you like okay which zombies do i want to kill which ones do i not want to kill which ones will i likely get a headshot with which ones can i burn because you can't burn all the zombies you have a limited supply of oil for burning i don't burn any zombies in this run because if you're rushing through it it's not really necessary so 
For the snake here, uh, throw like shoot three acid rounds with the grenade launcher, but don't throw, don't shoot a, a fourth one while it's upstairs because once you shoot three of them, it can't take any more damage upstairs. Wait for it to come downstairs, then shoot the final fourth one, and that pretty much kills a zombie. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, no lemons involved. But yeah, but there was another thing I wanted to mention. I forgot exactly what it was. Oh, right. Uh, why am I recording footage from the Steam Deck and not on the GameCube itself? Well, mostly for convenience. You know, if I recorded a run on the GameCube, I couldn't exactly n try no damaging this game while getting back from watching Mission Impossible. So that's like another thing I couldn't have done. But I do want to record a GameCube run whenever I try out a Chris walkthrough because, well... On the Steam Deck, I've only done Jill's campaign, but on the GameCube, I've only done Chris's campaign. So I think it only makes sense that if I were to return to, you know, do a Chris no damage, I'll do it on the GameCube. And playing on the GameCube, I'll be forced to use tank controls. And also that footage will probably look better than this footage. Though the in-game 3D model will be a little bit more pixelated and not as clear as this new remaster but there will be a charm and also it'll be upscaled with like the retro tank 5x okay there will be actually one okay so this section here is pretty tough so you're gonna have to run straight to this door because there's gonna be a regenerator waiting there to jump you then like the little bald zombie okay they're all bald but this one has a little bit of hair on him that guy sometimes is closer to you he might grab you sometimes I actually was i actually was in a situation where i got grabbed by that zombie so here i'm going to use a shotgun to shoot that guy to alert him here and once he's drawn out there we're going to shoot him with an acid round that should be a one hit kill for that zombie no that hunter and then that hunter's gonna run up the stairs and try to hit you so like that section has screwed me over so many times and is the reason why i saved earlier in this section you know because it's like that section is hard however you enter this door and then you enter back into the building into the building and that pretty much resets the second guy to not show up so like he'll be there he's still there somewhere i don't know where but not in any place that's like important to this run right now and also I have it okay but let me get back to the GameCube so like I if I were to record a GameCube run it would still be in 4x3 because that's what the original game was in I don't want to like stretch it out and I would be playing on my Wii which can play GameCube games but that Wii which I own it has a couple dead pixels like I don't know like it, it's something you might notice in my Ice Age 2 the meltdown no damage but some sections of the screen have like these little dead green black pixels and it's because that little console i bought is a bit slightly damaged so if i want clearer image i'm just gonna have to buy an actual new nintendo wii that can play gamecube games and it's like eh, whatever you know it's like a slight bit of wear and tear that's slightly noticeable who cares and with like the first resident evil game that's such a dark game that i don't even think you would notice it that's another thing about this remaster it's a lot brighter like there's some areas of the original game where i could barely tell like what was going on that's probably why i got stuck in some areas where like ooh, that's probably why i had to look up a walkthrough because it's like i did i couldn't even see the candle i had to light but here things have been made a lot brighter i guess for like modern displays i guess that's another thing some things that would probably be brighter on a crt are a bit darker on these modern more digital it's all digital isn't it i, I don't know exactly how this analog digital stuff works and here's run stick to the wall because if you stick to like the left wall there the hunter's always going to miss his attack I actually tried to follow a different path that was easier, but following that different path made that room harder. So, you know, always watch out for that. And I guess on that second visit to the mansion, uh, that statue will always be broken. because I guess one of the hunters pushed it down or something. So there is that. And now we're going here because there's a shortcut through the little painting room. So as Chris, you actually have to like waste one of the old keys to use this shortcut. But with Jill, it's just automatically unlocked. Well... Not exactly. This door, I think you have to open from the other side. You can't open it from this side, because I actually tried to open it from this side, and it just didn't work with the lockpick. But yeah, this is a great little shortcut to take to get to the save room on the right side. However, watch out. When you exit this room, there is going to be a hunter waiting for you, so you really do have to beeline to that second room here. But yeah, no, I definitely don't want to record another run on the Steam Deck, just because, like, it kind of lags a little. I have to record at 720p. And mind you, this game, you know, like, it's... No, 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 I had to record a 720p, it's like, eh. I mean, it was convenient, it was nice, I got my convenient run, but if I ever were to revisit this game, I do plan on doing the GameCube. And also another thing that makes the recording the GameCube version less convenient is that I would have to set up the Elgato, and then I have to set up the Retro Twin 5X, and the footage I record will take up a lot more space than the footage I'm recording here. Which leads me to another little tangent. Okay, so we're about to reach the end of this part, so the end of the complications is kind of over, and we're going to reach 
a simpler section of the game, and we are going to save here. And also, you can tell how my seg how my parts are segmented because, well, you see me physically save the game, and also every time I like get to a new recording, I cut to like the little intro screen where it's like fight your fears to see the darkness and all that. You know those little like ominous quotes every time you like open the game up again. Here it's gonna happen right now. I'm going to save the game. Look at those beautiful blue saves, by the way. Okay, in the original game, I'm pretty sure whenever you save the game, it was green, and then boom. New segment, In the Darkness Lies Your Fears. Ooh. But yeah, I had a unique problem here. So, like, the footage I recorded from the Steam Deck was, you know, the files were not big. Like, every single, like, video I recorded pretty much amounted to 1.5 gigabytes, which is, like, two hours of footage, which is great, I guess. But then when I, like, I tried to export the video on Premiere, I ran into an issue, and it's an issue with my charger. Oh, yeah, still, watch out for that Hunter. So, the charger I had uh, as of a day ago was not enough to charge my computer when it was exporting a video like it was like a tiny queue it was not a big queue for my computer so whenever i export so when i was exporting a video like the cube was not powerful enough to charge my computer my computer was actually losing battery while being charged while exporting the video so what would happen is i'd be exporting the video and then like the battery would get to red and like the video would go and also like the video took forever to export like i was originally going to export it at 1080p but the video was like oh it's gonna take eight hours and then like i went to bed and let it like export and then i wake up my computer's on red but somehow still running and then like I see the video, it's like, oh, it's gonna take 15 hours, 20% uh, done. I was like, what the fuck? So I kept experimenting. I tried to see, is there a way to make this export faster? And it's like, no. And then I go, okay, what if I make it 720p? Maybe it'll export faster. And even at 720p, its original resolution, it still said, oh, it's gonna take four hours. No, it's gonna take eight hours. So it's like, at that point, I just kind of knew I had to export this. I had to get a new charger. So I pretty much went to like a store, I got a bigger cube, and now my computer actually charges like a normal computer. Cause I used to have this like, uh, so like I'm, I edit my videos on my MacBook here and I used to own this like non-Apple product. It was like a black cube, it charged really well, but then at some point it just wore itself out. Like every time I plug it into a wall, it like sparks would fly everywhere. It was like a fucking hazard for children and it just stopped charging my computer well. So I had to get a new cube, but the new cube I got was a tiny cube, which charged my computer, but only when I wasn't doing anything extraneous. So whenever I was playing a video game on my laptop, mm, it, it was running out of battery. Whenever I have to export a video, it was running out of battery. And mind you, I just have not had to export a heavy video in such a long time. So see right there, when I climb the stairs, you have to stand still at the top of the stairs and wait for like the one snake to jump out. Because if you just immediately run, the snake that jumps out will attack you. So that's the other tricky snakes like position you have to watch out for. So yeah, now I have my big cube, it actually charges and uh, exporting actually exported in a reasonable amount of time. But I am still a little confused because the final video at 720p ended up being uh, seven gigabytes when my entire file before then was only 1.5 gigabytes. So I don't know how that works. I guess the Steam Deck recordings are just really, really like low file size. And yeah, here, another dog you have to shoot down. That was a real close call. Honestly, I'm a little worried. Did I take damage there or not? Could an Resident Evil expert like 100% confirm if I took damage there or not? Cause I'm pretty sure I didn't cause Jill didn't exactly react, but I, I was so close to taking damage at that point. Holy moly. And there we use the battery and that pretty much interconnects this area to the beginning so that we can use the crank to make the water full again, to make that waterfall not have water so that we can go to the next linear section of the game. Very nice. I guess to further elaborate on the hold up, I just ate three like uh, milanesas. Mm. Yeah, I was kind of trying to like, like it, the airs from that food were trying to like build up and stop me from speaking, but here I am speaking. So yeah, to just further elaborate on GameCube versus the Steam version, there's also the aspect of controls and Metal Gear Solid, the Twin Snakes and this Resident Evil remake are kind of similar in that you know, they're remakes of what were originally PS1 games. And I'm just gonna say it, I prefer the control scheme of the Steam version over the GameCube version. And I'm just curious, is the control scheme of the Steam version, if you just use like, you know, control scheme A, is that the same controls as the PS1 version? Because then Resident Evil 1 would be in the same boat as Metal Gear Solid 1 in that the original controls are better than the GameCube adaptation of those controls. Because like, 
I hate playing Metal Gear Solid 1 with, like, the GameCube controller, like, the remake. Like, I mean, just, like, the, the way you have to, like, map the buttons with, like, Y and X, just, I hate it. Like, Metal Gear Solid 1's controls are perfectly suited to the PS1 controller, the way that's mapped out. Because, like, the GameCube controller is very unique, but, like, I feel like that controller only really shines with games specifically made for it. Because then you try to, like, adapt the control scheme of Metal Gear Solid 1 to, like, the GameCube controller. It's like, oh, to climb, you have to press this tiny-ass, like, Y button? Like, shut the fuck up. Like, no, I want to press my triangle button to climb shit, okay? Like, that feels good. I hate pressing that tiny little thing to do anything. It's like, oh, to melee someone, you have to press the tiny B button. Like, ugh, it's disgusting. And also, like, you know, in order to use the codec, you have to press start and A. Are you fucking with me here? Like, get the fuck out of here, dude. Like, I just hate stuff like that with, like, the Twin Snakes remake. Now, for... Resident Evil 1's controls, they're not too bad. They're just slightly worse than the layout in the Steam version. I don't exactly hate the control setup they have on GameCube. It's also it's honestly kind of cute. You know, like, you hold down a button and then you press A, like the big A button. I think that's pretty dope. Though, now that I'm also thinking about comparing... Um, oh, yeah, also for this section, you kind of have to run past those hunters there. And that could be a little tricky. So, you have to get the red crank. And once you get the red crank, the green crank is basically pointless. You don't have to use it for anything else. So... We're gonna put away the green crank, and we're gonna use the red crank for the rest of the game. And okay, I guess I'm gonna stop talking about the differences between the GameCube and Steam version, because now I wanna talk about the cranks. So, pretty much the cranks are like one of the only items, like on every item in this game, like every like key item we have to use in like a puzzle, once you used it like, you know, in everything you needed to use it with, you can just discard it, but with the cranks, they're like undiscardable, and I guess it's because of a weird little loophole thingy where um, you can pretty much use the cranks as many times as you like. It's like, hey, what if you want to raise and lower the water levels again? You might as well keep the green crank. So there's never a point where you're done using it, even though you're done using it. Like, you don't need to raise or lower the water levels again, okay? Like, don't worry about it. But, you know, there is a potential that you might be do something stupid. Like, I don't know, leave an important key item in the residence. So maybe you do need to raise or lower the water level in order to go back to that area. So... <laughs> You, do, you could fuck yourself over, is what I'm saying. So, the items never disappear from your inventory. You're never told to discard them. Like, and this is the same thing with, like, the green and red crank. So, with the red crank, it's like, hey, what if you want to rotate that again? Maybe you could. Maybe you will. But you don't have to. But you could. I guess the reason I bring it up is because it's slightly inconvenient. Because it's like, you know, when every other item has been used up, it's like, oh, you can discard it. But... Since the cranks never get discarded, you know, it's like, oh, do I have to keep carrying them? Is there something important up ahead that I have to use them for? And it's like, no, not really. But like, at this point in time, you still need the red crank to do a couple puzzles. But once you do those puzzles, the thing doesn't disappear. It's still in your inventory. You don't get to discard it. It's like, ooh, is there another thing I have to use the red crank for? And, so, you know, it, it takes up a good amount of item space. I mean, and also, this is also important because the green one doesn't disappear, even though the only reason you need the green one is for the waterfall. So it's like, ooh, do I need the green crank later on? Like, ooh. So, yeah, for this boss fight here, we're going to spam him with the magnum rounds. And... There is a better strategy than what I'm doing, but what I'm doing is just kind of running around him, trying to get behind him. But you don't want to get too close behind him for the final shot. I think it takes like either three or four shots to put him down. So yeah, it takes four shots. And also there's a spider in the ceiling, which will, could become a problem. So once you land that final fourth shot, get further away from the spider. Because if you shoot him and you're behind him, that acid will hit you. It's kind of like a suicide attack. And then here, uh, this game does a convenient thing. This is like one of the only times you actually need the survival knife. But since the game knew that, I guess they kind of prepped this for a real survival. They just kind of have one in the area for you. So you don't have to like backtrack and re-get your knife if you left it behind somewhere. There's just one in the area for you. And also it's kind of a... And also on normal playthrough, it's a, it's kind of, it's a neat hint to tell you, Hey, uh, you probably need your knife to cut the webs on that door. So yeah, very nice. So you know, it's just very inconvenient, the whole red crank, blue crank. Because look, my inventory is like basically full so like i know when to get rid of my green crank i know when to get rid of my red crank and on those first playthroughs i mean i'm not getting any health items but on the, my first playthroughs yeah i was so it's like those red and green cranks become a bigger issue it's like oh how am i going to fit a healing item here how am i going to fit my ammo for my handgun Cause that's another thing i'm not using a handgun but in my first couple playthroughs i had a handgun because it's like oh i should use the less important weapon for the less important items when i didn't realize that you can just use some of the most powerful weaponry for most of the game and be pretty much good so yeah here we go. we're gonna use 
use the red crank here, then we're gonna use it in another puzzle room, and that pretty much like solves everything with the red crank. And yeah, a boulder is going to try to come and kill us once we're done with the cranking here. And the trick here is you're not supposed to run away from the boulder, you're kind of supposed to run towards it and to the left. Because before you ran away from the boulder, but now you run straight. Straight towards it. So another difference between the GameCube version and the Steam Deck version. Okay, so like the Steam Remaster is the exact same game plus a few costumes and oh yeah, there's one change. So in order to unlock real survival, you only have to beat the game once on the Steam Deck version, but on the GameCube version, you actually have to beat the game twice to unlock the real survival difficulty. So you do have to put in a little bit more busy work. So whenever I do try to do that Chris no damage on GameCube, I'm gonna have to beat the game normally once again, which frankly for Chris, I think I kind of need to because I, I don't know how to deal with that guy's like environments and also with getting the old keys. That's like a whole different conundrum. I gotta get used to that. And also got to get used to a smaller inventory size. And another thing is the frame rate. So on GameCube, this game was a cap 30, but on the Steam version here, uh, they gave you more. Uh, they gave you a 60 FPS frame rate, so it runs smoother. And also menus just open and close faster. Like on the GameCube version, like whenever you tr go to your inventory or try to open the map, there's longer waiting times when you do that. But on Steam, since we have just better technology and architecture that's a lot faster so you can kind of just jump in jump out of your menus and just very quick very fast 60 fps very nice while on gamecube there's a bit more waiting time in between there so runs might just take longer because of that and oh i wanted to make a little little silly video where i have jill kind of spinning around the little thing and i put like a funky little song there and just have that be a mimi Actually, I wanted to make another uh, mimi of resident evil 1 before just tapping out of this game because Okay, I do plan on doing a Chris run someday, but not soon though. I kind of have bigger fish to fry. I have to return to my Resident Evil 4 no damage, which I just kind of abandoned. I got a little sick of the game and I've just been jumping from game to game. I've been attempting to no damage the boss fights in Yakuza Ishin, but I kind of got fed up with that. Then I got, I had school. I had a little summer class I had to finish and oh yeah, I graduated by the way. I'm not in college anymore, but just finishing up some busy work here and there. But yeah, no, that's kind of gotten in the way of video games per se on YouTube, but I do plan on kind of returning to YouTube, maybe getting more proactive, maybe starting a Patreon, who knows. But I also am planning on getting a job soon, so I don't know how that's going to interfere with YouTube and whatnot, but yeah, I do plan on being more active in uploading videos because my activity these past few months has been a bit scarce and also the stuff I'm releasing just doesn't get that many views, but it has been pretty good stuff. I recommend watching it. <laughs> of course, I would recommend watching my own stuff, but yeah, we pretty much got the important item from that room, and we move on. When comparing uh, Resident Evil with Silent Hill, I don't think I've brought up David Lynch yet. Let, I, I, <laughs> I don't think I've brought up David Lynch yet, which if I haven't, I guess I'll do it now because the Silent Hill games are definitely very inspired by his stuff and I've seen basically every film of his except for Dumbland. I still need to see Dumbland and also like uh, most of his shorts, but for like his main theatrical releases, I've seen all of them. I actually plan on making a video where I rank all of them. I planned that a long time ago and I never would deliver it. Honestly, like I had this thing where every thousand subscribers, I'd make a new video where I rank stuff, you know, because I... I ranked all the Yakuza games, and then I made a video where I ranked all the final boss fights, and then I made a video where I ranked all the Fast and Furious movies, and well, that video is outdated now because a new one came out, but I don't really plan on updating that video. I think that video is pretty solid, and now like at 4,000 subscribers, I think I had said I would rank every single Kanye album. I never got around to that. I got a little tired of it. I don't know, because it's like at some point, I feel like ranking all the Kanye albums, like it could be a fun video, but also... What can I say that someone on TikTok hasn't summarized in like two minutes? <laughs> like, I don't know. I feel it's not exactly my genre, my expert genre of expertise per se. Oh, with this little puzzle, this puzzle is a little unusual compared to some of the other puzzles in this game because like, like the puzzles in this game have a little bit of a pattern to them and this one's a tiny bit of an outlier. So 
usually if you get two things you combine together, you know, you combine them together and then with some puzzle pieces, you have to like examine them to fully unlock them. So, you know, if you get a book, you have to examine the book in order to open the book and get like a key or a key item inside the book. But for this one, it's like, oh, you combine this thing and it's like, oh, if I turn it to, you know, so that the little numbers match up, then something will unlock. Not exactly. Those little numbers on that thing are only there to give you a clue to the code you have to input here. Like, actually twist, manually twisting the thing so that it matches up does nothing. If you already know what those numbers are, and like just with norm, with Roman numerals, like just, I already know what those numbers are from the top one, so actually twisting it like manually is pointless. And the code is indeed 4231. So there is that. Though I originally thought the code was 4321, so on the fly, I switched it to 4231. So, and look, a little handgun magazine, do not need to carry it, it's pointless. We're never using the handgun again. And there we unlock the elevator. So yeah, no, I forget exactly what videos I would even do for like all ranks. So I have two things in mind. I have all Kanye albums ranked. I, I've kind of abandoned the idea because the idea just bores me now. And now all David Lynch movies ranked. That is one which I definitely want to do. And well, I mean, if I keep talking about abandoned video ideas, like we could be here forever. There's the Kenzen story summary, which I recorded like 300 gigabytes of footage to do. I, I actually hope I still have that footage because I have like four to six hard drives and one of them uh, kinda, I kind of destroyed because I turned it into a Windows device, but I was still able to recover a bunch of stuff from that hard drive using like a data retrieval process. And here we have to go to another room. Alisa is here. She is very scary and spooky. We have to go to like another room to pick up a certain thing. And once we pick up that certain thing, we, oh no, no, not to pick up a certain thing, but to push a thing to go to another area so that when we go to that area, we can destroy the thing to get a thing. Just a little bit of padding here and there, I guess. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I'm at 8,000 subscribers, you know, like, I mean, I've made videos for when I'm at 3,000, but now I have like, what, one, two, three, four, five video ideas of ranking stuff, and uh, I only have two ideas. I could have sworn there was a third one that I forgot about, I don't know, like, hmm. Like, some people do kind of want me to redo my All Yakuza Games rank, but eh, nah, I don't know. I don't think it's really necessary, per se. And this cutscene, I don't know why you can't skip it. Honestly, like, with that little contraption, I kind of wish you could ride along with it. Like, just get on the box and just kind of ride. And here, you can actually climb these boxes to get an extra item. So you can get more handgun ammo or just this little battery pack, which is really what I wanted. So we got that. We're good to go. And, yeah, we pretty much have to return to a little Lisa thing and pretty much do a little thing. We have to pull a lever. Be very quick to get to a door, drop off a flamethrower. Oh, actually, we need to pick up that flamethrower because, like, the flamethrower, the broken flamethrower is in the box. So, here's a difference between the, uh, the Jill and Chris sections of this game. Chris gets access to an actual flamethrower and gets to use it. Jill never gets to use a flamethrower. However, on Jill's side, uh, she gets to use a grenade launcher. Chris never gets to use it. So, that's another thing that makes Chris's path harder. Uh, no grenade launcher because like the flamethrower it, it doesn't even help that much I don't know you try to kill the spider with the flamethrower you're too slow you're like uh, you're lumbering around I don't know maybe there is a way to know damage with the flamethrower because I mean it's a flamethrower you know it's gotta be useful somehow but I just feel like with most games a flamethrower causes more problems than like it fixes in like Far Cry 3 you use a flamethrower the grass catches on fire now it damages you in Deus Ex like a flamethrower just takes up too much fucking space in your inventory and it can harm you too so it's just like this is a weird weird weapons in these games the plane doors are just weird and weird in, re <laughs> in real life not in video games too they're pretty fucked up in real life too so like hmm but yeah no i don't know maybe all metal gear solid games ranked i've played all of them so i definitely love that series a lot but i don't know i'm gonna stick with david lynch because I definitely would love to do that little project. I uh, just need to actually write the script. I don't, I don't think I've written a script in like years. <laughs> like I don't know. I've been sticking mostly like these commentary, no commentary videos. And also I've been thinking about revisiting the Kiwami Ramp video just cause like I have an interesting angle to like revisit it while also talking about Lost Judgment. So that's kind of the idea I had for that. But I have not even begun to script that one and I'd rather finish the Lynch video. You know, just make more videos on movies and stuff and whatnot. And maybe one day, I'll return to the Kanye thing when I'm, when I gain interest for it. I don't know. What does this have to do with Resident Evil Remake? Not, not much. No. <laughs> oh man. 
I don't know what else to say about this game. I feel like I've covered everything I could at this contextual moment. Though I will say that while I was doing this run, you know, down here in this little dirty area, I think I was returning from the DMV. So, you know, the Steam Deck, very portable device. I also had Dunkin' Donuts that day. I had a coffee, a salted caramel cold brew, which was, it had salt in it, which is like, I ordered a salted caramel cold brew and I tasted the salt. I'm like, oh, there's salt in this? <laughs> like, oh my goodness. And then I had two donuts. Uh, one of them was wrong. I should have fixed that order, but I didn't. Just didn't have the time for it. So yeah, if Lisa's on the left side, we go to the right side, we pull the lever, and we continue running on the, on the right side. So yeah, alternate controls definitely makes the game easier. There's like some... The spider boss is definitely easier with alternate controls because without them, you'd pretty much just be stuck with the tank and you'd have to like, kind of like tank move around the spider. You just don't have the same mobility. Though alternate controls kind of do kind of have that issue where like, you know, forward becomes a different direction when the camera angle changes and all that. But the reason why alternate controls are so convenient is because like, I can just ignore them and use the D-pad. Because like, I mean, why, why would you even want to use a thumbstick for tank controls that's just terrible like whenever there's thunk like tank controls you use the d-pad it's like the more convenient option to do and you have access to that so yeah there's that and okay so these snakes just run 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 away from them yeah here we've kind of reached the lisa part and this reminds me that earlier in this run i got the self-defense gun and when you get the self-defense gun you also get a, you also get a suicide note but if you read the suicide note that messes up your speed run like what does this game think it is like it really thinks i'm going to spend time to read the suicide note like get out of here and here we've reached the little uh, stone ring so on my first playthrough uh when i got i'm gonna when i got that item the kind of like the red item there and it didn't have the stone ring i tried to use it on the door and i was so confused why i couldn't use it on the door that I actually looked up a walkthrough it was like what the fuck i have the item why is it not working but no you need need that stone ring And here we've pretty much looped back to this little area and there's going to be some extra zombies in the place where we killed the crows There's gonna be some zombies waiting for us And I think those zombies are specifically from you know the little part where you have to use the The masks or whatever. Hey that zombie which I failed to kill is here, but hey I get to shoot him down now So no wasted ammo here, but once you go to the next door and transition to the next area there's going to be uh, two zombies and the both of them are going to be I think the same models as those zombies that show up like in the, I don't know what the area is called. The one where you use like the gold the emerald in that little area, they're here. There's kind of like the fat bald one that's here. He's here. Wait, is that is that the fat bald one or is that oh the, there we go? That's the fat bald one. Yeah, that guy's here. Then the other guy's also here. So I guess they just kind of walked around and ended up in this location. And then since we use the shotgun shells, we can kind of, you know, get rid of an item slot and use that there. We had no Lisa. We're pretty much reaching the end of Lisa's like little sub story here, and it's like the most macabre, messed up thing in this entire game. Cause like, it I don't get exactly what it is. Like they were experimenting on like these three family members or two family members, and to create like a super zombie, and they kind of succeeded. But uh, the dad got killed. Uh, the mom I think is fused with the daughter somehow. I think or maybe no. I think the mom's also dead. And the daughter is just ripping people's faces off because she ripped off her mother's face or something. I don't know. And she's like in a state of delusion. It's like a... Okay, so I do have a tendency to misinterpret uh, plot points that might involve children getting killed, uh, if, if, as my Lost Judgment commentary has proved. But, uh, okay, so... Right, so something weird just happened like my premiere cut off and like I talked about like a mutilated five-year-old and like my mic just cut off. So... Like, I don't know, it's something weird happening with my Samsung Go mic. It just got destroyed, and I guess Steam decided, you know what? Uh, we're not going to tell him exactly that your mic has stopped working. It's just going to stop working. So, like, 
I talked for a pretty decently long time and my mic just decided to go, you know what? Yeah, no, we're not going to record that. We're not going to keep a track of that. Your mic is fucked. Uh, fuck you. But what I was going to say is that I'm not 100% sure if Lisa is like a mutilated five or six year old. Like, you know, like the fucking Lisa monster. Like, what, what's the age of that monster? I mean, is that the little girl? Is that the little girl mixed with her mom? Is our parts of the dad mixed in into that thing? Like, I know the Lisa monster has been ripping apart faces. It's like this, like this, is it like a five, six, seven year old girl that's this fucking Texas Chainsaw ass monster? By the way, I actually have seen the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. See, like, what I hate about my mic, like, turning off is that I don't know if I've mentioned this before. Because, like, I may have mentioned the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie before, or maybe this is the first time I'm mentioning it. But, yeah, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, final 20 minutes, she screams a lot. It's very gritty. I like it. Uh, The beginning, a little boring. That's what I think. But yeah, we pretty much reached the door where we actually have to use these medallions, and it's also the door that leads us to the Lisa boss fight. And since we're at the Lisa boss fight, I'm going to mention something from my outline here, which I think is important to mention, that pretty much uh, this section, this at this boss fight, this is where I pretty much get the bad ending, and I screw myself over, because I pretty much let Barry, wait, what? Oh, wait, 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 I think I used the medallions, then I go to a save room, and then I return to that room to do the boss fight because I needed to pick something up from the right save room, kind of like reorganize my inventory, because from this, from this point on, we're not really going to need to use the inventory. We're going to have every single item on our person that we need, or we're going to pick them up at this new final location we're headed towards. But yeah, pretty much at the Lisa boss fight, I got the bad ending despite making all the right choices because I let Barry die while fighting Lisa. Like, I don't know, apparently if Barry gets knocked off the platform, like, I was just moving the blocks and I was happy that Lisa didn't hit me. And then like I beat Lisa and that was awesome. Yeah, watch out for the hunter there. Ooh, close call right there. Okay, so I believe I'm, am I saving here? Yeah, I'm probably saving here. So I was just kind of surprised like, ooh, yeah, I beat Lisa. And see, okay, here's where I fuck myself because... Even if I messed up and got the bad ending because I let Barry die there, because I only noticed that Barry died when I reached the end of the game and I reached that tyrant fight with like the blue room and I realized, oh, Barry's not here. And that's when I realized, oh shit, he died. I didn't know he died until then. And here's where I screw myself over because instead of being smart, and like making a new save file that doesn't overwrite my previous save, I'm instead going to save in such a way where like the save right before this fight, oh wait, no. Actually, this is not exactly where I screw myself over, but it's in the next save where I screw myself over. So like here, we've reached the point where I have to go back to my first save. However, the next save I do, I actually overwrite my seventh save, which means I overwrite the save that puts me straight in the Lisa fight. And if I do want to get a good ending, I have to go all the way back to save six, do that entire underground courtyard section, which isn't the hardest thing in the world, but it's time consuming. It's like, I want to release the video. I want to move on. And hey, even if I get the bad ending, I still no damage the entire game. It's just one issue um no final boss fight so there's like a final boss fight on the helipad that only happens if you get like a good the best ending of sorts like you need barry alive to fight the boss fight later on so yeah i don't fight the second tyrant in this video oops i guess that's just something i have to do in the next couple videos i did no damage the whole game but yeah, no, not the final boss, so I do feel, I, I feel so cheated. I feel like I, I, I fucked up. I feel exactly like uh, PewDiePie when he got the bad ending in Ib. Like, you remember when PewDiePie played horror video games and didn't, like, review memes or something? Like, yeah, the good old days. <laughs> but, yeah, no, like, it was back in one of his old, like, playthroughs of Ib. He, like, beat the game, but he got a bad ending, and he didn't know he got a bad ending until after he beat the game. So he had to redo his entire playthrough to get the good ending, and that was like a whole little thing he did when he played horror games and Amnesia, and yada yada, old ass history. But yeah, no, like I just, I really did not notice that Barry died until I reached Wesker and the Tyrant fight, and I pretty much fucked myself over with the save. So like I could theoretically go back, redo the entire underground courtyard thing, but it's like. Mm, you know what, this will just be the bad ending run, and whenever I do Chris, I'll do the good ending run with Chris. Though, the thing is, their, their good best endings are slightly different. So, if you do the good best ending with Jill over here, you escape with yourself, Barry, and Chris. If you do it with Chris, you escape with Jill and Rebecca. So, it's like, if you do it with Jill, uh, a single woman and two men escape. If you do it with Chris, a single dude and two women escape. So there is a little difference here and there, but in both endings, Jill and Chris escape. And see, the thing, the thing that pisses me off is that if I was, if I was like, you know, like deliberately trying to do like a bad ending run, this video would be much shorter. 
But because I did the good ending, because like I was following Carcinogen's good ending route, this video takes longer. See, I give Get Barry's gun back, I assume he wouldn't die because he has his gun back and his gun is awesome, but no, he still has the chance to die. But if he does fall over, apparently he climbs back on a rope and you have to stay in the room and wait for him to climb back up. It's like, uh, what the fuck? See, because like, this fight is probably the most complicated in the game because it's not just shoot the enemy. You actually have to like push these things down and that pretty much brings her. The thing is, this fight could still be shoot the enemy because if sh if like a Lisa over here, see, that that's when he dies. I, you could hear him die. I was not paying attention. I think I actually did this part while on a car ride or something because I just, I didn't hear him go. Aah! So th that's when he died. He got knocked off. I hate this game. I hate this game so much. But yeah, there's actually a quicker way to defeat Lisa. If you shoot her with like the revolver or like a really good weapon, you can knock her off a ledge. And while you're shooting her, while she's on the ledge, she actually falls off. So you can... So here she like sees her mom and she feels regret and gets a bit of clarity and decides to kill herself there. Very macabre stuff. So yeah, this red and blue book are medallions to unlock the disc 2 location of the game. But still... <laughs> this video didn't have to be 2 hours and 25 minutes if I was going for the bad ending. Because also I wouldn't need the MO discs. But hey, now that I got the MO disc, I guess I'll just save Chris, but no Barry, because what the bad ending basically is, is that you don't blow up the mansion, so all that disgusting, dangerous creatures, they still exist, and there will probably be more of them. Mind you, that's going to happen regardless, even if you do blow up the mansion. I actually don't know how this series continues lore-wise. I think maybe they did or didn't blow up the mansion. I'm not a Resident Evil lore expert, so if someone could clarify that in the comments, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. So yeah, once you reach this section, like on GameCube, you wouldn't enter this area until you enter the second disc. Also, in this area on the Steam version, at least on the Steam Deck, while recording on OBS, it lags like hell for me. Like this area, it's going to be one of the most laggy areas in the game. And here, I'm going to take a chance to save and not have it be a 20-minute interlude. Because at this point, I have so many saves, I can kind of save whenever I want, pretty much. So this is going to be... And see, here I fucked myself over. I saved over the save I needed to reload because of hubris. Why didn't I save over my first save? Oh, I want to keep it. Why? Why the fuck would I want to keep it? Because now, boom, bad ending. And if I want to get a good ending, I have to go through so much busy work to get to it. And it's like, ugh. But yeah, no, we're in the final section of the game. This is the disc two area. And it's pretty much just an eighth of this video, which I mean is about 20 minutes or so, a little less. And yeah, here we go. There's going to be a couple zombies. We're going to blow their heads off. And for some of the zombies, I think I want to use the revolver just to like kind of waste the two bullets I have there. But for now, I'm going to stick with the shotgun. And some of them, they don't get their heads blown off. But in this section, I don't have any uh, crimson heads. Though, you know, watch out. Uh, crimson heads are possible to spawn in this area. So, you know, just be careful. And here, I think I wasted a shotgun bullet. But... Whatever, we're in the end of the game. We can waste a bit of ammo at this point in time. We're actually going to pick up more shotgun bullets in a specific area of this area. So what we have to do is we have to go down here. Then we have to go into a room. We have to enter a passcode. Now, that passcode is actually found in another room. But since I already know what the passcode is, I don't need to go to that other room at this time. So I can just use the system and then boom, blow that guy's head off. Because in this area specifically, we really do not need any zombies roaming around. Because we have to solve a puzzle where we're forced to only walk. So it's best to blow that guy's head off. And we definitely do not want any crimson heads in that area specifically. So we go to this little computer. The login is John. The password is Ada. Now with John, you can see me spell that out. But with Ada, it's like, oh, it's a password. You also have to press enter to get to the password. Oh, what letter is that? What letter is that? I mean, you can just look at what I'm typing. You'll know. And then we get to access. I love this little interface. You know, it's just like so cute and, you know, old. <laughs> so yeah, that's fun. So yeah, the password to like that extra password was cell. 
you know, cells, interlinked cells, and you would figure it out with a puzzle in another room. However, since I already know what the password is, that other room is kind of pointless and we're never going to visit it from what I understand. Unless there's a specific item in there, is there? I don't think there is. I think we're never going to visit that room. We don't have to do that puzzle, but it is a puzzle. So that password is findable and it was pretty easy to find. But like, you know, I love this area. I love this camera angle. It's so spooky and cool. And like the smoke blowing in there, like, oh, it's just such a swan song for pre-rendered backgrounds. Like, I mean, with games nowadays, you just really can't do this. I guess the one issue with pre-rendered backgrounds is like, well, upscaling, it's an issue because, you know, they're very specific photos and, Yada yada. And okay, so it was an MO disc on that table over there. I forgot to pick it up, but I will be picking it up on my way back. And yeah, we reached a section where there's a puzzle that I just never learned how to solve. I never knew to put like the slide filter on the film, which you can see in this room. So I, I just now know the code. And now I'm never going to solve this puzzle since I'm always going to know the code to put on. But if I ever, if I ever do a fourth playthrough normally and, um, you know, I forget the code, I guess I'll finally use the slide filter on that film. So. And here we get to pick up the laboratory key from the room we just unlocked. And is there anything else to pick up? No, there was the MO disc, which I think I already picked up. And then there's the MO disc over there. And then we have our three MO discs to save Chris. So you need to input those at three different separate locations. Yeah, don't forget it, it's there. And boom, our inventory is pretty packed full of stuff. I think about this time. Oh, actually I think I'm saving some revolver bullets or magnum bullets specifically for these bugs. And also remember how I mentioned that um, Every enemy that can grab you can grab you. Well, this next bug, I forgot what they're called. I think they're the Chimera. I don't know why they're called the Chimera, but there's the next enemy we're going to encounter, well, besides the zombies, are called the Chimera. So the Chimera can only grab you if they're, like, up on the ceiling, and then they just, like, lunge at you from above and grab you and try to, like, choke you in the air. That is when you can use your, like, your... Um, reversal item on them i forgot or your defense item so that's how you can get grabbed by them and not take damage but every other attack they do is like a swing a cut so it's not good to bait them out for a defense item that's just like a you know a saving grace if they somehow grab you while they're upstairs but you're never going to really run into that situation for no damage because you're either going to kill that bug or run away from that bug and never be in position to get grabbed by that bug so you can't really take advantage of it like that it's not advantageous to try to take advantage of their ability to grab you because it's kind of rare compared to the, all the other attacks. Like, So yeah, there is that. So here's the first computer we're going to use the MO disk on. It's kind of in the first room. So beep, 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 boom. And also these lights depend on which MO disk you use. I thought like the number of the lights turning on depended on which station you go to. No, it depends on which disk you put in first. So. The first disc I put in there is disc number one, but you can put in disc number three at that station and the third light will light will beep up. Same thing with the second light, so on and so forth. Oh yeah, we got shotguns in this area, but I think you've already, oh yeah, we're actually gonna get them on our way back because I, I didn't have enough item space to actually you know, carry the shotgun shells. But now that we do, I can get them and now I can put them into my shotgun and, and now my shotgun is full of bullets to use. Very, very nice. I guess a controversial take, maybe. I mean, maybe not so controversial since like both of these games are some of the most popular games ever in this sort of genre of sorts. But between this game and Resident Evil 4, I definitely think I prefer the gameplay of Resident Evil 4. That's probably still my favorite Resident Evil. Just that kind of style of survival horror with the more elaborate action set pieces appeals more to me. When it comes to this game's qualities, I mean, I think the one thing I prefer in this game over those Resident Evil 4 style games, just the sense of non-linearity, because Resident Evil 4 is a pretty linear game, you know, you go from one area to another, while here, you have this mansion where like one key opens another door in another place, like, that is a sort of experience that those future games never really recapture. I mean, at most, Resident Evil 4 and the Resident Evil 4 remake kind of have a thing where if you backtrack to a place which you wouldn't normally backtrack to, you'll get more treasure, but it's not really the same, is it? So here we have to kill this creature because we're going to have to walk through this area at a slow pace and not really fire many guns. So, you know, if this creature's in the way and our only option is to walk, we're going to get screwed. And the, the Magnum here pretty much kills him in one shot. Like, messing around with him with, like, a shotgun doesn't kill them immediately. Messing around with a grenade launcher, the thing isn't like hit scan based so it can miss. So here we're going to go into this area, get this canister, and then we have to backtrack to a fuel room we haven't been to before. 
in order to fill it up with fuel, and then begins the walking, the walkening per se. And I guess the one question I really don't want to ask myself is, do I prefer Resident Evil 5 or this one? Do I prefer Resident Evil 6 or this one? Just honestly, even entertaining the thought of that conversation is kind of sacrilegious though, isn't it? <laughs> oh man. Like, hey, I mean, you know, Resident Evil 5, it's got that combat, but it also has that fucking horrible, like, final chapters. While this game's final chapter is just kind of... It's, it's low-key, I don't know, at least compared to some of the other stuff in the game. I just I, don't, I just feel like this game doesn't end as bombastically as I would have liked. I mean, this area's neat, but oh well. I guess that's also a fault of the original game. I mean, you know, if you're remaking it, you can't exactly avoid it. It's like, this area's neat. It's got nice, like, things to it, but I don't know. It's also got a couple of neat puzzles and tricks, and hey, look, I just blew that guy's head completely off, and now I have more space in my inventory, which I don't necessarily need. I just need to... Yeah, I don't necessarily need, but it's good that I killed that zombie. So very nice. Oh, and ooh, we're going to use the final... No, the second MO disc. The final MO disc is actually used later on. And also, just getting the bad ending also makes the little climax here a little anticlimactic. Mind you, even when you do the full climax, it, it's, it's cool, fact. But, you know, still, like, my feeling of I wish there was more oomph to this ending, per se, is still kind of there. I don't know. But, yeah, no. Here, we have to walk all the way to where we will fuel this thing up which is pretty much where we pick this thing up we have to fuel it so i was walking i had the grenade launcher and enemy showed up i used the grenade launcher i blew up and died now i'm not sure if that the same thing would happen if i had a pistol or a magnum or a shotgun i think maybe that might happen but i feel with the grenade launcher since it it was a grenade maybe i blew up because of that or maybe you'll just blow up if you shoot anything but running's the main thing. Do not run. Mind you, you can run like a little, little bit and then it won't blow up. But, you know, once you run, you've already set it on a little bit of a timer. So just do not run. Just do not run. But I did accidentally run at one point in like my second playthrough. So, oh my god. I just, I do love walking through these really atmospheric, like ghostly areas. Like, ooh, it's like, you know, the survival horror is kind of gone-ish because, you know, you have most of the ammunition you need, but, like, now it kind of comes back because you're just walking so slow. It's like, ooh, ooh. You have to really soak in these, like, lovingly crafted pre-rendered areas. Like, oh, here we go. There's some beautiful smoke coming in through that left, right side door thing. Oh, and there's water dripping. Like, oh, oh, like, oh my goodness. A crude thing to say, but uh, Jill, the boobs, they have physics. Uh-oh, if you've noticed, you've noticed. If you haven't, you haven't. But what my biggest question about this is, does is it the same thing in the PS1 games? Like, I doubt it, but fucking these developers, like, never doubt them. I don't know, just think, like, in this fucking era, there was always jiggle physics for everything. But yeah, no, I'm just, the, the fucking PS1 games have that? The remake? Is that just an addition of the remake? So yeah, here, we're just gonna run away from the Chimera things, and we're going to use the grenade launcher to really fuck them up. And it's good to kill the first Chimera with the Magnum, because like the very first Chimera you meet in this little, in like the area before this area, by the way, this, this, in this area, the little red area, this is where we use the MO disc. Like, but the very first Chimera you encounter in this kind of like three area stretch of land here, like the first one's the trickiest one, while the rest of them, they just kind of walk, they kind of run slow at you, so you can just run away from them, and yeah, the alternate controls definitely help a lot with avoiding those chimeras. And then here we're in this final room, we have to pretty much turn on the power to the elevator, which leads us to Wesker. And then there's a self-destructing, which cannot be activated without Barry, and if the self-destructing isn't activated without Barry, the final minutes of this game are a lot more anticlimactic. It's like, you know, if once Barry activates the self-destruct sequence, you can kind of hear a alarm going, me, 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 you know, the music is really intense, and like, you know, bum, 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 it's like more action-y movie, so it really does feel like an ending, while here, once you get the bad ending, it's still the same creepy atmospheric music, and it's just like, Am I, am, did I do something wrong? I mean, what, what, what are we doing here? You know, what, what am I fighting for? Uh, and here I'm going to do a, do a little cheeky save point. Wait, no, not here. But once I get past this area, I'm actually going to do a, a, a cheeky save point just to like 
be fully prepared for the tyrant instead of having to like do this entire section and tyrant because tyrant is tricky enough to a point where you kind of want to like prepare for him you could definitely mess up a run just by messing up tyrant but like the save area is right there so you know i might as well waste a little bit of time and use up my next saver because i see here's the thing so the first save point you get in this disc two area you get three ink ribbons and then there's this other room and you get three more ink ribbons so six of the ink ribbons are in this final area i think that's a little bit absurd because like you are so how are you why would you need to save six times in this final area six times you have to run to a save point manually and save six times like, I think one of those increments should have been put in another area of the game or something. Because, like, this is, this is a little ridiculous. But, I mean, mind you, hey, you know, more power to the player or whatever. But, like, only in this section of the game. Like, okay, before you activate the self-destruct sequence, are you allowed to backtrack all the way to another section of the game? Even if you enter this area? That's what I'm wondering about. Is that possible? You know, if you really just want to get non-linear with it? Because the thing about non-linear games is that you don't normally play them the way I'm playing this one now. You know, because like I'm playing this in a very linear fashion, but a non-linear game, you explore, you have fun, you re-enter rooms which you have no reason to re-enter just because you'd like to re-enter them, you know, like, you maybe just chill in a hallway for a little bit because, hey, I like this hallway. You know, that that's the fun of non-linearity is that you're not necessarily forced to run somewhere as fast as possible. Oh, with linear games, you know, if you're playing Mario, it's a 2D plane, you know. Even Mario, even 2D Mario games can be non-linear. Because, like, the pipes can take you to, like, secret areas or take you to a different path. And different paths can, like, skip certain things. So, like, even, okay, so that's not a, a great example of a linear game, but it is. And here, we're go I'm going to use the Magnum. Like, usually, you, you'd want to use the rocket launcher, but I'm going to use the Magnum because I think it's cooler. And you'll waste about the same amount of ammo, you know, like... One, two, one, two, you, I'm kind of leading him around corners just because like once he gets close to me, I can just run to like the separate part of the corner and be safe there. But yeah, pretty much you just kind of loop him around like that and boom, and he's died. Because like I really wanted to use the Magnum in a cool way against this guy. I didn't want to like end it with just the rocket launcher because with the grenade launcher because pretty much uh, the only reason you'd use the grenade launcher here is to save magnum bullets for the final final fight but since i'm getting the bad ending i'm never going to fight the final final fight so that's just over so like what you do normally is you go to barry and go like barry you're all right and barry's like oh i'm gonna activate the self-destruct sequence so yeah release the lock open the door now i'm just gonna go save chris which i don't even think you have to save chris really i think you actually just avoid that and get the worst ending of them all where everyone dies and it's just jill on the helipad alone afraid i'm not even sure about that is that even possible like are you allowed to leave without rescuing chris like i mean i i remember that there was an ending where like chris and barry can die oh yeah, also in the final final fight uh the two support characters can also are capable of dying so there's plenty of ways to like screw up and get like a bad ending per se even in like the final boss so you know be prepared for that but for right now i'm pretty much good what i have to do is pretty much go to that one hallway with like the one room which i'm never going to explore because that room only exists to give you the answer to a puzzle in another room and we're pretty much good from there however see in this section normally if you're getting the best ending there will be action music and an alarm will be blaring go wah, wah, wah. but here it's just atmosphere music and also yeah uh, bugs will start to follow you into this area so you have to run away from them you know be careful they're pretty slow so if you're constantly running you're good don't mind you with alternate controls it is much easier to run away from these enemies than in the original game because the original game it's tank controls you know you have a little bit of delay when changing specific directions and here we have to pull each of these switches manually so you know you you switch that one on then you have to press it again and again and then you meet up with chris and the thing is the little prison room that chris is in has extra flame rounds which is super useful for the final boss fight which i'm not going to fight <laughs> oh man oh man I, I how did i mess it up? i messed it up at the very last minute but you know what if i didn't mess it up i wouldn't be talking about it if i wouldn't be talking about it then this sense of commentary would be different you know it's like ooh, that, that, that's interesting in its own right isn't it i i hope ooh. So yeah, this video is 
pretty much done at this point. There isn't really much to say. We kind of have to like backtrack back to like the beginning of this area because once we go to that area, we don't necessarily exit this area. We just go to like a locked door that is now not going to be locked and we can use like an elevator that takes us up to like a helipad of some sort and go from there. Come and on. here we have a fun little cutscene, but Barry would be in that cutscene. It's also like I'm skipping the cutscene. So like what's funny is when you encounter Wesker, there's actually two different cutscenes. There's one cutscene where it's just Jill encountering Wesker, and there's one where it's Barry and Jill encountering Wesker. But since I skip all the cutscenes because I'm doing like a sort of speed run no damage of the game, I skipped the cutscene and didn't notice that Barry did not follow me to meet Wesker. So I only noticed after I defeated the tyrant, I'm like, hey, uh, I need to talk to Barry. Where is Barry, by the way? I'm trying to talk to him because I think I need to talk to him to activate a cutscene. It's like, oh, I guess I don't have to talk to him this time. I'll go and beat the game. And then I beat the game and realize, oh, wait, I, Barry's not here. There is no final boss. What is going on? Oh. But yeah, no. So pretty much we go back here. We climb up these stairs. And from this stair, we go to like the door we weren't able to open before. And then we go to like this hallway and we have to solve like a final weird puzzle. I don't know why the developer did this. Like this game is directed by Shinji Mikami and he's done a ton of amazing stuff. He's one of, he's a fantastic director. Love that guy. But there's like this final section, this final like action-y section. Mind you, this game being short is not a problem because this game is very replayable. Like every time I replay this game, I enjoy it more and more because I understand it more. I get to play around with the mechanics and also like on future replays, I'll be able to use like fun weapons and all that, but, and also extra difficulties. Invisible enemy mode, that honestly, see like there's this final puzzle where, oh, you have to pick up this item and insert it here. It's like a tiny bit of busy work. It's like you go to this door and like, I mean, when you're playing this on the best ending, you know, the alarms are blaring. It's like, oh, we're going to self-destruct this thing. So it stresses you out. It's like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? This door is locked. You have to go back and get that fuse thing. It's like a, a neat, tiny, like, little, like, task to do, which, like, stresses you out. It's like, oh. And then you enter this elevator. And, okay, to be fair, it, even, even if Barry was alive, you still enter this elevator alone because Barry and Chris hold off the monsters downstairs. While here, it's just Chris holding on the monsters downstairs. And, hey, he survives. He comes up later. And there's no tyrant that bursts through here. You pretty much just get these fuel rockets. No, these signal rockets. You signal them. The helicopter comes. And the game is done. And, yeah, uh, that is my no damage run. So, yeah, thank you so much for watching. And I will see you all then. Jill, you did a fine job. 